Verses Popular and Humorous by Henry Lawson Preface My acknowledgments of the courtesy of the editors and proprietors of the newspapers in which most of these verses were first published are due and gratefully discharged on the eve of my departure for England. Chief among them is the Sydney Bulletin. Others are the Sydney Town and Country Journal, Freeman's Journal, and Truth and the New Zealand Mail. A few new pieces are included in the collection. Sydney, March 17th, 1900. End of Preface Chapter 1 The Ports of the Open Sea Down here where the ships loom large in, the gloom when the sea storms veer, down here on the southwest margin of the western hemisphere, where the might of a world-wide ocean round the youngest land rolls free, storm-bound from the world's commotion, lie the ports of the open sea. By the bluff where the grey sand reaches to the curb of the spray-swept street, by the sweep of the black sand beaches from the main road traveller's feet, by the heights like a work titanic, begun ere the gods' work ceased, by a bluff-lined coast volcanic, lie the ports of the wild southeast. By the steeps of the snow-capped ranges, by the scarped and terraced hills, far away from the swift life changes, from the wear of the strife that kills, where the land in the spring seems younger than a land of the earth might be, oh, the hearts of the rovers hunger, for the ports of the open sea. But the captains watch and hearken, for a sign of the South Sea wrath, let the face of the southeast darken, and they turn to the ocean path. Ay, the sea boats dare not linger, whatever the cargo be, when the southeast lifts a finger, by the ports of the open sea. South by the bleak bluff faring, north where the three kings wait, southeast the tempest daring, flight through the storm-tossed strait. Yonder a white-winged roamer, struck where the rollers roar, where the great green froth-flaked coma breaks down on the black-ribbed shore. For the southeast lands are dreadlands, to the sailors in the shrouds, where the low clouds loom like headlands, and the black bluffs blur like clouds. When the breakers rage to windward, and the lights are masked a lee, and the sunken rocks run inward, to a port of the open sea. But oh, for the southeast weather, the sweep of the three days gale, when far through the flaxened heather the spindrift drives like hail. Glory to man's creation, that drive where the gale grows gruff, when the homes of the seacoast stations flash white from the darkening bluff, when the swell of the southeast rouses the wrath of the Maori sprite, and the brown folk flee their houses and crouch in the flax by night, and wait as they long have waited, in fear as the brown folk be, the wave of destruction fated, for the ports of the open sea, grey clouds to the mountain bases, wild boughs that rush and sweep, on the rounded hills the tussocks, like flocks of flying sheep, a lonely storm-bird soaring, o'er tussock fern and tree, and the boulder beaches roaring, the hymn of the open sea. End of Chapter One. The Three Kings. The Three Kings refers to three sea girt pinnacles off North Cape, New Zealand. The east is dead and the west is done, and again our course lies thus, southeast by fate and the rising sun, where the three kings wait for us. When our hearts are young and the world is wide, and the heights seem grand to climb. We are off and away to the Sydney side, but the three kings bide their time. I've been to the west, the digger said. He was bearded, bronzed, and old. Ah, the smothering curse of the east is wool, and the curse of the west is gold. I went to the west in the golden boom, with hope and a lifelong mate. They sleep in the sand by the boulder soak, and long may the three kings wait. I've had my fling on the Sydney side, said the black sheep to the sea. Let the young fool learn when he can't be taught. I've learnt what's good for me. And he gazed ahead on the sea-line dim, grown dim in his softened eyes, with a pain in his heart that was good for him, as he saw the three kings rise. A pale girl sits on the foxhole head. She is back, three kings so soon. But it seems to her like a lifetime dead since she fled with him, saloon. 
There is refuge still in the old folk's arms for the child that loved too well. They will hide her shame on the southern farm, and the three kings will not tell. Twas a restless heart on the tide of life, and a false star in the skies, that led me on to the deadly strife where the southern London lies. But I dream in peace of a home for me by a glorious southern sound, as the sunset fades from a moonlit sea, and the three kings show us round. Our hearts are young, and the old hearts old, and life on the farm is slow, and away in the world there is fame and gold, and the three kings watch us go. Our heads seem wise, and the world seems wide, and its heights are ours to climb. So it's off and away, in our youthful pride, but the three kings bide our time. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 the outside track. There were ten of us there on the moonlit quay, and one on the forward hatch. No straighter mate to his mates than he had ever said lends a match. Twill be long, old man, ere our glasses clink. Twill be long ere we grip your hand. And we dragged him ashore for a final drink, till the whole wide world seemed grand. For they marry and go as the world rolls back. They marry and vanish and die. But their spirit shall live on the outside track as long as the years go by. The port lights glowed in the morning mist that rolled from the waters green, and over the railing we grasped his fist as the dark tide came between. We cheered the captain and cheered the crew, and our mate, time's out of mind, we cheered the land he was going to, and the land he had left behind. We roared Lang Syne as a last farewell, but my heart seemed out of joint, I well remember the hush that fell when the steamer had passed the point. We drifted home through the public bars. We were ten times less by one who sailed out under the morning stars and under the rising sun. And one by one and two by two they have sailed from the wharf since then. I have said good-bye to the last I knew, the last of the careless men. And I can't but think that the times we've had were the best times after all, as I turn aside with a lonely glass and drink to the barroom wall. But I'll try my luck for a check out back, then a last good-bye to the bush, for my heart's away on the outside track, on the track of the steerage push. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 Sydney sighed. Where's the steward? Barroom steward? Berth. Oh, any berth will do. I have left a three-pound billet just to come along with you. Brighter shines the star of rovers on a world that's growing wide, but I think I'd give a kingdom for a glimpse of Sydney side. Run of rocky shelves at sunrise, with their base on ocean's bed, homes of Coogee, homes of Bondi, and the lighthouse on South Head. For in loneliness and hardship, and with just a touch of pride, has my heart been taught to whisper, you belong to Sydney side. Oh, there never dawned a morning in the long and lonely days, but I thought I saw the ferries steaming out across the bays, and as fresh and fair in fancy did the picture rise again as the sunrise flushed the city from Woolhara to Balmain. And the sunny waters frothing round the liners black and red, and the coastal schooners working by the loom of Bradley's head, and the whistles and the sirens that re-echo far and wide, all the life and light and beauty that belonged to Sydney side. And the dreary cloud line never veiled the end of one day more, but the city set in jewels rose before me from the shore. Round the sea world shined the beacons of a thousand ports of coal, but the harbour lights of Sydney are the grandest of them all. Toiling out beyond Coolgardy, heart and back and spirit broke, where the rover's star gleams redly in the desert by the soak. But says one mate to the other, Brace your lip and do not fret. We will laugh on trains and buses. Sydney's in the same place yet. Working in the south in winter, To the waste in dripping fern, Where the local spirit hungers For each sixpence that we earn. We can stand it for a season, For our world is growing wide, And they all are friends and strangers Who belong to Sydney side. T'other ciders, t'other ciders, Yet we wake the dusty dead. It is we that send the backward province fifty years ahead. We it is that trim Australia, making narrow country wide. Yet we're always t'other siders, till we sell for Sydney side. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 The Rovers 
Some born of holy parents, for ages settled down, the steady generations of village, farm, and town, and some of dusky fathers, who wandered since the flood, the fairest skin or darkest might hold the roving blood. Some born of brutish peasants, and some of dainty peers, in poverty or plenty, they passed their early years, but born in pride of purple, or straw and squalid sin, in all the far world corners, the wanderers are kin. A rover or a rebel, conceived and born to roam, as babies they will toddle, with faces turned from home. They fought beyond the vanguard, wherever storm has raged, and home is but a prison, they pace like lions caged. They smile and are not happy, they sing and are not gay, they weary, yet they wander, they love and cannot stay. They marry and are single, who watch the roving star, for by the family fireside, O oh, lonely men they are. They die of peace and quiet, the deadly ease of life, they die of home and comfort, they live in storm and strife. No poverty can tie them, nor wealth nor place restrain, girl, wife, or child might draw them, but they'll be gone again. Across the glowing desert, through naked trees and snow, across the rolling prairies, the skies have seen them go. They fought to where the ocean receives the setting sun, but where shall fight the rovers, when all the lands are won? They thirst on Greenland snowfields, on never-never sands, where man is not to conquer, they conquer barren lands. They feel that most are cowards, that all depends on nerve. They lead who cannot follow, they rule who cannot serve. Across the plains and ranges, away across the seas, on blue and green horizons, they camp by twos and threes. They hold on stormy borders of states that trouble earth, the honour of the country that only gave them birth. Unlisted, uncommissioned, untaught of any school, in far away world corners, unconquered tribes they rule. The lone hand and revolver, sad eyes that never quail, the lone hand and the rifle that win where armies fail. They slumber sound where murder and treachery are bare, the pluck of self-reliance, the pluck of past despair. Thin brown men in pyjamas, the thin brown wiry men, the helmet and revolver that lie beside the pen. Through drought and desolation, they won the way out back. The commonplace and selfish have followed on their track. They conquer lands for others, for others find the gold. But where shall go the rovers, when all the lands are old? A rover and a rebel, and so the worlds commence. Their hearts shall beat as wildly, ten generations hence. And when the world is crowded, tis signed and sealed by fate. The roving blood will rise to make. The countries desolate. End of chapter five. Chapter six. Foreign lands. You may roam the wide seas over, follow, meet, and cross the sun, sail as far as ships can sail, and travel far as trains can run. You may ride and tramp wherever range or plain or sea expands, but the crowd has been before you, and you'll not find foreign lands. For the early days are over and no more the white-winged rover sinks the gale-worn coast of England, bound for bays in foreign lands. Foreign lands are in the distance, dim and dreamlike, faint and far, long ago and over yonder, where our boyhood fancies are. For the land is by the railway, cramped as though with iron bands, and the steamship and the cable did away with foreign lands. Ah, the days of blue and gold, when the news was six months old, but the news was worth the telling in the days of foreign lands. Here we slave the dull years hopeless for the sake of wool and wheat. Here the homes of ugly commerce, niggard farm and haggard street. Yet our mothers and our fathers won the life the heart demands. Less than fifty years gone over, we were born in foreign lands. When the gypsies stole the children still in village tale and song, and the world was wide to travel, and the roving spirit strong, when they dreamed of South Sea Islands, summer seas and coral strands, then the bravest hearts of England sailed away to foreign lands. Fitting foreign, flood and field, half the world and orders sealed. 
and the first and best of Europe went to fight in foreign lands. Canvas towers on the ocean, homeward bound and outward bound, glint of topsails over islands, splash of anchors in the sound. Then they landed in the forests, took their strong lives in their hands, and they fought and toiled and conquered, making homes in foreign lands. Through the cold and through the drought, further on and further out, winning half the world for England in the wilds of foreign lands. Love and pride of life inspired them when the simple village hearts followed Master Will and Harry, gone abroad to foreign parts. By our townships and our cities, and across the desert sands, are the graves of those who fought and died for us in foreign lands. Gave their young lives for our sake? Was it all a grand mistake? Sons of Master Will and Harry, born abroad in foreign lands. Ah, my girl, our lives are narrow, and in sordid days like these, I can hate the things that banished foreign lands across the seas. But with all the world before us, God above us, hearts and hands, I can sail the seas in fancy, far away to foreign lands. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 Mary Lemaine Jim Duff was a native as wild as could be, a stealer and duffer of cattle was he, but back in his youth he had stolen a pearl, or a diamond rather, the heart of a girl. She served with a squatter who lived on the plain, and the name of the girl, it was Mary Lemaine. Twas a drear rainy day and the twilight was done, when the four mounted troopers rode up to the run. They spoke to the squatter, he asked them all in. The homestead was small, and the walls they were thin, and in the next room, with a cold in her head, our Mary was sewing on buttons, in bed. She heard a few words, but those words were enough. The troopers were all on the track of Jim Duff. The super, his rival, was planning a trap, to capture the scamp, in McGuinness's gap. I've warned him before, and I'll do it again. I'll save him tonight, whispered Mary Lemaine. No petticoat job, there was no time to waste. The suit she was mending she slipped on in haste, and five minutes later they gathered in force. But Mary was off on the squatter's best horse, with your hand on your heart, just to deaden the pain. Ride hard to the ranges, brave Mary Lemaine. She rode by the ridges all sullen and strange, and far up long gullies that ran through the range, till the rain cleared away and the tears in her eyes caught the beams of the moon from McGuinness's rise. A fire in the depths of the gums she espied. "'Who's there?' shouted Jim. "'It is Mary,' she cried. Next morning the sun rose in splendour again, and two loving sinners rode out on the plain, and baffled and angry and hungry and damp, the four mounted troopers rode back to the camp. But they hushed up the business, the reason is plain. They all had been soft on fair Mary Lemaine. The squatter got back all he lost from his mob, and old Sergeant Kennedy winked at the job. Jim Duff keeps a shanty far out in the west, and the sundowners call it the bush ranger's rest. But the bush ranger lives a respectable life, and the law never troubles Jim Duff or his wife. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 The Shakedown on the Floor Set me back for twenty summers, for I'm tired of cities now. Set my feet in red soil furrows, and my hands upon the plough, with the two black brothers trudging on the home stretch through the loam, while along the grassy siding come the cattle grazing home. And I finish ploughing early, and I hurry home to tea. There's my black suit on the stretcher, and a clean white shirt for me. There's a dance at Rocky Rises, and when all the fun is o'er, for a certain favoured party, there's a shakedown on the floor. You remember Mary Carey, Bushman's favourite at the rise, with her sweet small freckled features, red gold hair and kind grey eyes, sister, daughter to her mother, mother, sister to the rest, and of all my friends and kindred, Mary Carey loved me best. Far too shy because she loved me, to be dancing oft with me. What cared I, because she loved me, if the world were there to see? But we lingered by the slip-rails, while the rest were riding home, ere the hour before the dawning, dimmed the great star-clustered dome. Small brown hands that spread the mattress, while the old folk winked to see how she'd find an extra pillar, and an extra sheet for me. 
for a moment shyly smiling, she would grant me one kiss more, slip away and leave me happy by the shakedown on the floor. Rock me hard in steerage cabins, rock me soft in wide saloons, lay me on the sand hill lonely under waning western moons. But wherever night may find me, till I rest for evermore, I will dream that I am happy on the shakedown on the floor. Ah, she often watched at sunset, for her people told me so, when I left her at the slip-rails more than fifteen years ago, and she faded like a flower, and she died, as such girls do, while away in northern Queensland, working hard, I never knew. And we suffer for our sorrows, and we suffer for our joys, from the old bush days when mother spread the shakedown for the boys. But to cool the living fever comes a cold breath to my brow, and I feel that Mary's spirit is beside me even now. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 Reedy River Ten miles down Reedy River a pool of water lies, and all the year it mirrors the changes in the skies, and in that pool's broad bosom is room for all the stars, its bed of sand is drifted, or countless rocky bars. Around the lower edges there waves a bed of reeds, where water rats are hidden, and where the wild duck breeds, and grassy slopes rise gently to ridges long and low, where groves of wattle flourish, and native bluebells grow. Beneath the granite ridges the eye may just discern where Rocky Creek emerges from deep green banks of fern, and standing tall between them, the grassy she-oaks cool, the hard blue-tinted waters, before they reach the pool. Ten miles down Reedy River, one Sunday afternoon, I rode with Mary Campbell to that broad, bright lagoon. We left our horses grazing till shadows climbed the peak, and strolled beneath the she-oaks on the banks of Rocky Creek. Then home along the river, that night we rode a race, and the moonlight lent a glory to Mary Campbell's face. And I pleaded for my future all through that moonlight ride, until our weary horses drew closer side by side. Ten miles from Ryan's Crossing, and five below the peak, I built a little homestead on the banks of Rocky Creek. I cleared the land and fenced it, and ploughed the rich red loam, and my first crop was golden when I brought Mary home. Now still down Reedy River, the grassy she-oaks sigh, and the water-holes still mirror, the pictures in the sky, and over all forever go sun and moon and stars, while the golden sand is drifting across the rocky bars. But of the hut I builded there are no traces now, and many rains have levelled the furrows of the plough, and my bright days are olden, for the twisted branches wave, and the wattle blossoms golden on the hill by Mary's grave. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 Old Stone Chimney The rising moon on the peaks was blending, her silver light with the sunset glow, when a swagman came as the day was ending, along a path that he seemed to know. But all the fences were gone or going, the hand of ruin was everywhere, the creek unchecked in its course was flowing, for none of the old clay dam was there. Here time had been with his swiftest changes, and husbandry had westward flown. The cattle tracks in the rugged ranges were long ago with the scrub o'ergrown. It must have needed long years to soften the road that as hard as rock had been. The mountain path he had trod so often lay hidden now with a carpet green. He thought at times from the mountain courses he heard the sound of a bullock bell, the distant gallop of stockmen's horses, the stockwhip's crack that he knew so well. But these were sounds of his memory only, and they were gone from the flattened hill, for when he listened the place was lonely, the range was dumb, and the bush was still. The swagman paused by the gap and faltered, for down the gully he feared to go, the scene in memory never altered, the scene before him had altered so. But hope is strong, and his heart grew bolder, and over his sorrows he raised his head. He turned his swag to the other shoulder, and plodded on with a firmer tread. Ah, hope is always the keenest hearer, 
and fancies much when assailed by fear. The swagman thought as the farm drew nearer, he heard the sounds that he used to hear. His weary heart for a moment bounded, for a moment brief he forgot his dread, for plainly still in his memory sounded the welcome bark of a dog long dead. A few steps more and his face grew ghostly, then white as death in the twilight grey, deserted wholly and ruined mostly, the old selection before him lay. Like startled spectres that paused and listened, the few white posts of the stockyard stood, and seemed to move as the moonlight glistened, and paled again on the whitened wood. And thus he came from a life long banished, to other lands and of peace bereft, to find the farm and the homestead vanished, and only the old stone chimney left. The field his father had cleared and gardened was overgrown with saplings now, the rain had set, and the drought had hardened, the furrows made by a vanished plough. And this, and this, was the longed-for haven, where he might rest from a life of woe. He read a name on the mantle graven, the name was his, ere he stained it so. And so remorse on my care encroaches, I have not suffered enough, he said, that name is pregnant with deep reproaches, the past won't bury dishonoured dead. Ah, now he knew it was long years after, and felt how swiftly a long year speeds, the hardwood post and the beam and rafter had rotted long in the tangled weeds. He found that time had for years been sowing the coarse wild scrub on the homestead path, and saw young trees by the chimney growing, and mountain ferns on the wide stone hearth. He wildly thought of the evil courses that brought disgrace on his father's name, the escort robbed, and the stolen horses, the felon's dock with its lasting shame. Ah, oh God, ah, oh God, is there then no pardon? He cried in a voice that was strained and hoarse. He fell on the weeds that were once a garden, and sobbed aloud in his great remorse. But grief must end, and his heart ceased aching, when pitying sleep to his eyelids crept, and home and friends who were lost in waking, they all came back while the stockman slept, and when he woke on the empty morrow, the pain at his heart was a deadened pain, and bravely bearing his load of sorrow, he wandered back to the world again. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 Song of the Old Bullock Driver Far back in the days when the blacks used to ramble in long single file neath the evergreen trees, the wool teams in season came down from Canamble, and journeyed for weeks on their way to the sea. T'was then that our hearts and our sinews were stronger, for those were the days when the bushman was bred. We journeyed on roads that were rougher and longer than roads where the feet of our grandchildren tread. With mates who have gone to the great never-never, and mates whom I've not seen for many a day, I camped on the banks of the Kujigong River, and yarned at the fire by the old bullock tray. I would summon them back from the far riverina, from days that shall be from all others distinct, and sing to the sound of an old concertina their rugged old songs where strange fancies were linked. We never were lonely for camping together. We yarned and we smoked the long evenings away, and little I cared for the signs of the weather when snug in my hammock slung under the dray. We rose with the dawn were it ever so chilly when yokes and tarpaulins were covered with frost and toasted the bacon and boiled the black billy, where high on the campfire the branches were tossed. On flats where the air was suggestive of possums, and homesteads and fences were hinting of change, we saw the faint glimmer of apple-tree blossoms, and far in the distance the blue of the range. And here in the rain there was small use in flogging the poor tortured bullocks that tugged at the load, when down to the axles the wagons were bogging, and traffic was making a marsh at the road. "'Twas hard on the beasts on the terrible pinches, where two teams of bullocks were yoked to a load, and tugging and slipping and moving by inches, halfway to the summit they clung to the road. And then, when the last of the pinches was bested, you'll surely not say that a glass was a sin. The bullocks lay down neath the gum trees and rested. The bullockies steered for the bar of the inn. Then slowly we crawled by the trees that kept tally of miles that were passed on the long journey down, we saw the wild beauty of Carpety Valley as slowly we rounded the base of the crown. 
But ah, the poor bullocks were cruelly goaded, while climbing the hills from the flats and the vales. Twas here that the teens were so often unloaded, that all knew the meaning of counting your bales. And oh, but the best pay and load that I carried was one to the run where my sweetheart was nurse. We courted a while, and agreed to get married, and couple our futures for better or worse. And as my old feet grew too weary to drag on, the miles of rough metal they met by the way, my eldest grew up, and I gave him the wagon. He's plodding along by the bullocks today. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 The lights of Cobb and Co. Fire lighted on the table a meal for sleepy men. A lantern in the stable. A jingle now and then. The mail coach looming darkly by light of moon and star. The growl of sleepy voices. A candle in the bar. A stumble in the passage of folk with wits abroad. A swear word from a bedroom. The shout of, all aboard. Get up, hold fast there, and down the range we go. Five hundred miles of scattered camps will watch for Cobb and Co. Old coaching towns already, decaying for their sins, uncounted halfway houses, and scores of ten-mile inns, the riders from the stations by lonely granite peaks, the black boy for the shepherds on sheep and cattle creeks, the roaring camps of Gulgong, and many a digger's rest, the diggers on the Lachlan, the huts of furthest west, some twenty thousand exiles who sailed for weal or woe, the bravest hearts of twenty lands will wait for Cobb and Co. The morning star has vanished, the frost and fog are gone, in one of those grand mornings which but on mountains dawn. A flask of friendly whiskey, each other's hopes we share, and throw our top coats open to drink the mountain air. The roads are rare to travel, and life seems all complete. The grind of wheels on gravel, the trot of horses' feet, the trot, 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 and canter, as down the spur we go, the green sweeps to horizons blue that call for Cobb and Co. We take a bright girl actress through western dust and damps to bear the home world message and sing for sinful camps, to wake the hearts and break them, Wild hearts that hope and ache, ah, oh, when she thinks of those days, her own must nearly break. Five miles this side the gold field, a loud triumphant shout. Five hundred cheering diggers have snatched the horses out. With old Lang Syne in chorus through roaring camps they go, that cheer for her and cheer for home and cheer for Cobb and Co. Three lamps above the ridges and gorges dark and deep, a flash on sandstone cuttings, where sheer the sidings sweep. A flash on shrouded wagons, on water ghastly white, weird bush and scattered remnants of rushes in the night. Across the swollen river, a flash beyond the ford. Ride hard to warn the drivers. He's drunk or mad, good Lord. But on the bank to westward, a broad triumphant glow. A hundred miles shall see tonight the lights of Cobb and Co. Swift scramble up the siding, where teams climb inch by inch, pause bird-like on the summit, then breakneck down the pinch, past haunted halfway houses where convicts made the bricks, scrub yards and new bark shanties we dash with five and six, by clear ridge country rivers and gaps where tracks run high, where waits the lonely horseman cut clear against the sky, through stringy bark and blue gum and box and pine we go, New camps are stretching across the plains, the routes of Cobb and Co. Throw down the reins, old driver, there's no one left to shout. The ruined inn's survivor must take the horses out. A poor old coach hereafter, we're lost to all such things. No bursts of song or laughter shall shake your leathern springs. When creeping in unnoticed by railway sidings drear, or left in yards for lumber, decaying with the year, Oh, who'll think how in those days, when distant fields were broad, you raced across the Lachlan side with twenty-five on board. Not all the ships that sail away since roaring days are done, not all the boats that steam from port, nor all the trains that run, shall take such hopes and loyal hearts, for men shall never know, such days as when the Royal Mail was run by Cobb and Co. The greyhounds race across the sea, the special cleaves the haze, but these seem dull and slow to me compared with roaring days. 
The eyes that watched are dim with age, and souls are weak and slow. The hearts are dust, or hardened now, that broke for Cobb and Co. End of Chapter 12 Chapter 13 How the land was won. The future was dark and the past was dead, as they gazed on the sea once more. But a nation was born when the immigrants said goodbye as they stepped ashore. In their loneliness they were parted thus because of the work to do, a wild, wide land to be won for us, by hearts and hands so few. The darkest land neath a blue sky's dome, and the widest waste on earth, the strangest scenes and the least like home in the lands of our father's birth. The loneliest land in the wide world then, and away on the furthest seas, a land most barren of life for men, and they won it by twos and threes. With God or a dog to watch they slept by the campfire's ghastly glow, where the scrubs were dark as the blacks that crept, with nulla and spear held low. Death was hidden amongst the trees, and bare on the glaring sand. They fought and perished by twos and threes, and that's how they won the land. It was two that failed by the dry creek bed, while one reeled on alone, the dust of Australia's greatest dead, with the dust of the desert blown, gaunt cheekbones cracking the parchment skin that scorched in the blazing sun, black lips that broke in a ghastly grin, and that's how the land was won. Starvation and toil on the tracks they went, and death by the lonely way, the childbirth under the tilt or tent, the childbirth under the dray, the childbirth out in the desolate hut with a half-wild gin for nurse. That's how the first were born to bear the brunt of the first man's curse. They toiled and they fought through the shame of it, through wilderness, flood and drought. They worked in the struggles of early days, their son's salvation out. The white girl wife in the hut alone, the men on the boundless run. The misery suffered, unvoiced, unknown, and that's how the land was won. No armchair rest for the old folk then, but ruined by blight and drought, they blazed the tracks to the camps again, in the big scrubs further out. The worn half wet with the father's sweat, gripped hard by the eldest son, the boy's back formed to the hump of toil, and that's how the land was won. And beyond up country, beyond out back, and the rainless belt they ride, the currency lad and the ne'er do well, and the black sheep side by side. In wheeling horizons of endless haze that disk through the great northwest, they ride forever by twos and by threes, and that's how they win the rest. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 The Boss Over the Board When he's over a rough and unpopular shed, with the sins of the bank and the men on his head, when he mustn't look black or indulge in a grin, and thirty or forty men hate him like sin. I am moved to admit, when the total is scored, that it's just a bit off for the boss of the board. I have battled a lot, but my dreams never soared, to the lonely position of boss of the board. T'was a blacklisted shed down the darling, the boss, was a small man to see, though a big man to cross. We had naught to complain of, except what we thought, and the boss didn't boss any more than he ought. But the union was booming, and brotherhood soared, so we hated like poison the boss of the board. We could tolerate hands, we respected the cook, but the name of a boss was a blot in our book. He'd a row with Big Duggan, a rough sort of Jim, or rather, Jim Duggan was laying for him. His hate of injustice and greed was so deep that his shearing grew rough, and he ill-used the sheep. And I fancied that Duggan, his manliness lowered, when he took off his shirt to the boss of the board, for the boss was ten stone, and the shearer full grown, and he might have, they said, let the crawler alone. Though some of us there wished the fight to the strong, yet we knew in our hearts that the shearer was wrong, and the crawler was plucky, it can't be denied, for he had to fight freedom and justice beside. But he came up so gamely, as often as flawed, that a black leg stood up for the boss of the board, and the fight was a sight, and we pondered that night. It's surprising how some of those blacklegs can fight. Next day at the office, when sadly the wreck of Jim Duggan came up like a lamb for his check, said the boss, Don't be childish, it's all past and gone. I'm short of good shearers, you'd better stay on. 
and we fancied Jim Duggan, our dignity lord, when he stopped to oblige a damned boss of the board. We said nothing to Jim, for a joke might be grim, and the subject we saw was distasteful to him. The boss just went on as he'd done from the first, and he favoured Big Duggan no more than the worst, and when we'd cut out and the steamer came down, with the hawkers and spielers to take us to town, and we'd all got aboard, twas Jim Duggan, good lord, who yelled for three cheers for the boss of the board. Twas a bit off, no doubt, and with freedom about, but a lot is forgot when a shed is cut out. With freedom of contract maintained in his shed, and the curse of the children of light on his head, he's apt to long sadly for sweetheart or wife, and his views be inclined to the dark side of life. The truth must be spread, and the cause must be shored, but it's just a bit rough on the boss of the board. I am for the right, but perhaps, out of sight, as a son or a husband or father, he's white. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 When the ladies come to the shearing shed, the ladies are coming, the super says, to the shearers sweltering there, and the ladies' means in the shearing shed, don't cut em too bad, don't swear, the ghost of a pause in the shed's rough heart, and lower is bowed each head, and nothing is heard save a whispered word, and the roar of the shearing shed. The tall, shy rouser has lost his wits, and his limbs are all astray. He leaves a fleece on the shearing board, and his broom in the shearer's way. There's a curse in store for that jackaroo, as down by the wall he slants, and the ringer bends with his legs askew, and wishes he'd patch them pants. They are girls from the city, our hearts rebel as we squint at their dainty feet, and they gush and say in a girly way that the dear little lambs are sweet, and Bill the ringer, who'd scorn the use of a childish word like damn, would give a pound that his tongue were loose as he tackles a lively lamb. Swift thoughts of home in the coastal towns or rivers and waving grass, and our weight our hearts that we cannot define that comes as the ladies pass, but the rouser ventures a nervous dig in the ribs of the next to him, and Baku says to his penmate Twig, the style of the last and Jim. Jim Moonlight gives her a careless glance, then he catches his breath with pain. His strong hand shakes in the sunlight dance as he bends to his work again. But he's well disguised in a bristling beard, bronze skin and his shearer's dress, and whatever Jim Moonlight hoped or feared were hard for his mates to guess. Jim Moonlight, wiping his broad white brow, explains with a doleful smile, a stitch in the side, and he's all right now, but he leans on the beam a while, and gazes out in the blazing noon on the clearing brown and bare. She has come and gone like a breath of June, in December's heat and glare. The bushmen are big rough boys at the best, with the hearts of a larger growth, but they hide those hearts with a brutal jest, and the pain with a reckless oath. Though the bills and jims of the bush bard sing, of their life loves lost or dead, the love of a girl is a sacred thing not voiced in a shearing shed. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 The Ballad of the Rouseabout A rouseabout of rouseabouts, from any land or none. I bear a nickname of the bush, and I am a woman's son. I came from where I camped last night, and at the day-dawn glow, I rub the darkness from my eyes, roll up my swag, and go. Some take the tracks for bitter pride, some for no pride at all, but to us all the world is wide when driven to the wall. Some take the track for gain in life, some take the track for loss, and some of us take up the swag as Christ took up the cross. Some take the track for faith in men, some take the track for doubt, some flee a squalid home to work their own salvation out, some dared not see a mother's tears nor meet a father's face, born of good Christian families, some leap headlong from grace. Oh, we are men who fought and rose, or fell from many grades. Some born to lie and some to pray, we're men of many trades. We're men whose fathers were and are of high and low degree. The sea was open to us, and we sailed across the sea. And were our quarrels wrong or just, has no place in my song. We see it our souls in puzzling, as to what was right or wrong. We judge not, and we are not judged, tis our philosophy. There's something wrong with every ship that sails upon the sea. From shearing shed to shearing shed we tramp to make a check. Jack Cornstalk and the ne'er do well, the tar boy and the wreck. We learn the worth of man to man, and this we learn too well. The shanty and the shearing shed are warmer spots in hell. 
I've humped my swag to Borley Plain and further out and on. I've bawled my billy by the gulf and boiled it by the swan. I've thirsted in dry lingam swamps and thirsted on the sand, and eked the fire with camel dung in Never Never Land. I know the track from Spencer's Gulf and north of Cooper's Creek, where falls the half caste to the strong, black velvet to the weak. From gold top flossy in the strand to half caste in the gin, if they had brains, poor animals, we'd teach them how to sin. I've tramped and camped and shore and drunk with many mates out back, and every one to me is Jack, because the first was Jack. A lifer sneaked from jail at home, the straightest mate I met, a ratty Russian nihilist, a British baronet. I know the tucker tracks that feed or leave one in the lurch, the Burgoo, Presbyterian track, the Murphy, Roman church. But more than man and not the track so much as it appears, for battling is a trade to learn, and I've served seven years. We're haunted by the past at times, and this is very bad, and so we drink till horrors come, lest sober we go mad. So much is lost out back, so much of hell is realised. A man might skin himself alive, and no one be surprised. A rouseabout of rouseabouts, above, beneath regard. I know how soft is this old world, and I have learnt how hard. A rouseabout of rouseabouts, I know what men can feel. I've seen the tears from hard eyes slip, as drops from polished steel. I learned what college had to teach, and in the school of men, by campfires I have learned, or say, unlearned it all again. But this I've learned, the truth is strong, and if a man go straight, he'll live to see his enemy, struck down by time and fate. We hold him true who's true to one, however false he be. There's something wrong with every ship that lies beside the quay. We lend and borrow, laugh and joke, and when the pass is drowned, we sit upon our swags and smoke and watch the world go round. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 Years after the war in Australia, the big rough boys from the runs out back were first where the balls flew free and yelled in the slang of the outside track, By God, it's a Christmas spree. It's not too rusty, and wool away. Stand clear of the blazing shoots. sheep o, sheep o, we'll cut out today. Look out for the boss's boots. What price the tally in camp tonight? What price the boys out back? Go at you tigers, for right or might, and the pride of the outside track. Needle and thread, I broke my comb. Now ride, you flower bags, ride. Fight for your mates and the folk at home. Here's for the Lachlan side. Those men of the West would steer and scoff at the gates of hell ajar, and off the sight of a head cut off was hailed by a yell for tar. I heard the push in the red redoubt, irate at a luckless shot. Look out for the bloomin' shell, look out. Gord blimey, but that's red hot. It's Bill the Slogger. Poor bloke, he's done. A chunk of the shell was his. I wish the beggar that fired that gun could get within reach of Liz. Those foreign gunners will give us rats, but I wish it was Bill they missed. I'd like to get at their bleeding hats with a rock in my something fist. Hold up, Billy, I'll stick with you. They've hit you under the belt. If we get the waddle, I'll swag you through, if the blazing mountains melt. You remember the night when the traps got me for stoush and a bleeding chow, and you went from proper and laid out three, and I won't forget it now. And groaning and swearing, the pug replied, I'm done. They've knocked me out. I'd fight them all for a pound a side, from the boss to the rouse about. My nut is cracked and my leg is broke, and it gives me worse than hell. I trained for a scrap with a twelve-stone bloke, and not with a burst in shell. You needn't mag, for I knowed old chum, I knowed old pal you'd stick. But you can't hold out till the regulars come, and you'd best be nowhere quick. They've got a force and a gun ashore. Both our wings is broke. They'll storm the ridge in a minute more, and the best you can do is smoke. And Jim explained, You can smoke, you chaps, but me, gore blimey, no. The push that ran from the George Street traps won't run from a foreign foe. I'll stick to the gun while she makes them sick, and I'll stick to what's left of Bill. And they hiss through their blackened teeth. We'll stick, by the blaze and flame we will. And long years after the war was passed, they told in the town and bush, how the ridge of death to the bloody last was held by a Sydney push. How they fought to the end in a sheet of flame. How they fought with their rifle stocks. And earned, in a nobler sense, the name of their ancient weapons, rocks. In the western camps it was ever our boast when twas bad for the kangaroo. 
If the enemy's force takes the coast, they must take the mountains too. They may force their way by the western line or round by a northern track, but they won't run short of a decent spree with the men who are left out back. When we burst the enemy's ironclads and we won by a run of luck, we whooped as loudly as Nelson's lads when a French three-decker struck. And when the enemy's troops prevailed, the truth was never heard. We lied like heroes who never failed explaining how that occurred. You bushmen sneer in the old bush way at the new chum jackaroo, but cuffs and collars are out that day, and they stuck to their posts like glue. I never believed that a dude could fight till a Johnny led us then. We buried his bits in the rear that night for the honour of George Street men. And Jim the Ringer, he fought he did, the regiment nicknamed Jim. Old heads a caser and heads a quid, but it never was tails with him. The way that he rode was a racing rhyme, and the way that he finished grand. He backed the enemy every time, and died in a hand to hand. I'll never forget when the ringer and I were first in the bush brigade, with Warrigo Bill from the live till you die in the last grand charge we made. And Billy died, he was full of sand, he said as I raised his head. I'm full of love for my native land, but a lot too full of lead. Tell him, said Billy, and tell old Dad to look after the cattle pup. But his eyes grew bright, though his voice was sad, and he said as I held him up, I've been happy on western farms, and once when I first went wrong, around my neck were the trembling arms of the girl I'd loved so long. Far out on the southern seas I've sailed, and ridden where brumbies roam, and oft, when all on the station failed, I've driven the outlaw home. I've spent the check in a day and night, and I've made a check as quick. I struck a nugget when times were tight, and the stores had stopped our tick. I've led the field on the old bay mare, and I hear the cheering still, when mother and sister and she were there, and the old man yelled for Bill. But save for her, could I live my while again in the old bush way, I'd give it all for the last half mile in the race we rode today. And he passed away as the stars came out, he died as old heroes die. I heard the sound of the distant rout, and the Southern Cross was high. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 The Old Jimmy Woodser The old Jimmy Woodser comes into the bar, unwelcomed, unnoticed, unknown, too old and too odd to be drunk with by far, and he glides to the end where the lunch baskets are, and they say that he tipples alone. His frock coat is green and the nap is no more, and the style of his hat is at rest. He wears the peaked collars our grandfathers wore, the black ribbon tie that was legal of yore, and the coat buttoned over his breast. When first he came in, for a moment I thought that my vision or wits were astray, for a picture and page out of Dickens he brought. T'was an old file dropped in from the chancery court to a wine fault just over the way. But I dreamed as he tasted his bitters tonight and the light in the bar-room grew dim, that the shades of the friends of the other day's light, and of girls that were bright in our grandfather's sight, lifted shadowy glasses to him. And I opened the door as the old man passed out, with his short shuffling step and bowed head, and I sighed, for I felt as I turned me about, an odd sense of respect born of whiskey, no doubt, for the life that was fifty years dead. And I thought there are times when our memory trends, through the future as twere on its own, that I out of date, ere my pilgrimage ends, in a new-fashioned bar to dead loves and dead friends, might drink like the old man alone, while they whisper he boozes alone. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 The Christ of the Never, with eyes that seem shrunken to pierce, to the awful horizons of land, through the haze of hot days and the fierce, white heat-waves that flow on the sand, through the Neverland westward and norward, bronzed, bearded, and gaunt on the track, quiet-voiced and hard-knuckled rise forward, the Christ of the outer, out back, for the cause that will ne'er be relinquished, spite of all the great cynics on earth, in the ranks of the bush indistinguished, by manner or dress, if by birth, God's preacher of churches unheeded, God's vineyard, though barren the sod, Plain spokesman where spokesman is needed, Rough link twixt the bushman and God. He works where the hearts of all nations Are withered in flame from the sky, Where the sinners work out their salvations In a hell upon earth ere they die. In the camp or the lonely hut lying, 
in a waste that seems out of God's sight. He's the doctor, the mate of the dying, through the smothering heat of the night. By his work in the hells of the shearers, where the drinking is ghastly and grim, where the roughest and worst of his hearers have listened bareheaded to him, by his pass through the parched desolation, hot rides and the terrible tramps, by the hunger, the thirst, the privation of his work in the furthermost camps, by his worth in the light that shall search men and prove I and justify each, I place him in front of all churchmen who feel not, who know not, but preach. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 The Cattle Dog's Death The plains lay bare on the homeward route, and the march was heavy on man and brute, for the spirit of drought was on all the land, and the white heat danced on the glowing sand. The best of our cattle dogs lagged at last, his strength gave out ere the plains were past, and our hearts grew sad when he crept and laid his languid limbs in the nearest shade. He saved our lives in the years gone by, when no one dreamed of the danger nigh, and the treacherous blacks in the darkness crept on the silent camp where the drovers slept. The dog is dying, a stockman said, as he knelt and lifted the shaggy head. Tis a long day's march, ere the run be near, and he's dying fast. Shall we leave him here? But the super cried, there's an answer there, as he raised a tuft of the dog's grey hair and strangely vivid each man descried the old spear mark on the shaggy hide. We laid a bluey and coat across the camping pack of the lightest horse, and raised the dog to his deathbed high, and brought him far neath the burning sky. At the kindly touch of the stockman rude, his eyes grew human with gratitude, and though we parched in the heat that fags, we gave him the last of the water-bags. The super's daughter we knew would chide, if we left the dog in the desert wide, so we brought him far o'er the burning sand for a parting stroke of her small white hand. But long ere the station was seen ahead, his pain was o'er for the dog was dead, and the folks all knew by a looks of gloom, twas a comrade's corpse that we carried home. End of poem. Chapter twenty one. The Song of the Darling River, preface to the poem. The only national work of the blacks was a dam or dyke of stones across the Darling River at Brewerina. The stones they carried from Lord knows where, and the Lord knows how. The people of Burke kept up navigation for months above the town by a dam of sandbags. The Darling rises in blazing droughts from the Queensland rains. There are banks and beds of good clay and rock along the river. The skies are brass and the plains are bare. Death and ruin are everywhere and all that is left of last year's flood is a sickly stream on the grey-black mud. The salt springs bubble and quagmires quiver, and this is the dirge of the Darling River. I rise in the drought from the Queensland rain. I fill my branches again and again. I hold my billabongs back in vain. For my life and my people's the South Seas drain, and the land grows old and the people never will see the worth of the Darling River. I drown dry gullies and lave bare hills. I turn drought ruts into rippling rills. I form fair islands and glades all green, till every bend is a sylvan scene. I have watered the barren land ten leagues wide, but in vain I have tried, ah, in vain I have tried, to show the sign of the great all-giver, the word to a people, O oh, lock your river. I want no blistering barge aground, but racing steamers the seasons round. I want fair homes on my lonely ways, a people's love and a people's praise, and rosy children to dive and swim, and fair girls' feet in my rippling brim, and cool green forests and gardens ever. Oh, this is the hymn of the Darling River. The sky is brass and the scrublands glare, death and ruin are everywhere, thrown high to bleach or deep in the mud. The bones lie buried by last year's flood, and the demons dance from the never-never to laugh at the rise of the Darling River. End of poem. Chapter 22 Rain in the mountains, the valleys full of misty cloud, its tinted beauty drowning, the eucalypti roar aloud, the mountain fronts are frowning, the mist is hanging like a pall from many granite ledges and many a little waterfall starts o'er the valley's edges. 
The sky is of a leaden grey, save where the north is surly. The driven daylight speeds away, and night comes o'er as early. But, love, the rain will pass full soon, far sooner than my sorrow, and in a golden afternoon the sun may set to-morrow. End of poem. Chapter 23 A May Night on the Mountains Tis a wonderful time when these hours begin, these long small hours of night, when grass is crisp and the air is thin, and the stars come close and bright. The moon hangs caught in a silvery veil from clouds of steely grey, and the hard cold blue of the sky grows pale in the wonderful milky way. There is something wrong with this star of ours, a mortal plank unsound, that cannot be charged to the mighty powers who guide the stars around. Though man is higher than bird or beast, though wisdom is still his boast, he surely resembles nature least, and the things that vex her most. Oh, say some muse of a larger star, some muse of the universe, if they who people those planets far are better than we or worse. Are they exempted from deaths and births, and have they greater powers, and greater heavens, and greater earths, and greater gods than ours? Are our lies theirs, and our truth their truth? Are they cursed for pleasure's sake? Do they make their hells in their reckless youth, ere they know what hells they make? And do they toil through each weary hour, till the tedious day is o'er, for food that gives but the fleeting power, to toil and strive for more? End of poem. Chapter 24 The New Chum Jackaroo let bushmen think as bushmen will, and say whate'er they choose. I hate to hear the stupid sneer at new chum jackaroos. He may not ride as you can ride, or do what you can do, but sometimes you'd seem small beside the new chum jackaroo. His share of work he never shirks, and through the blazing drought he lives the old things down and works his own salvation out. When older, wiser chums despond, he battles brave of heart, Twas he who sailed of old beyond the margin of the chart. Twas he who proved the world was round in crazy square canoes. The land you're living in were found by new chum jackaroos. He crossed the deserts hot and bare from barren hungry shores, the plains that you would scarcely dare with all your tanks and bores. He fought away through stubborn hills toward the setting sun. Your father's all and Burke and Wills were new chums every one. When England fought with all the world in those brave days gone by, and all its strength against her hurled, he held her honour high. By southern palms and northern pines, whate'er was life to lose, she held her own with thin red lines of new chum jackaroos. Through shot and shell and solitudes, wherever feet have gone, the new chums fought while eyed glass dudes and johnnies led them on. And though he wear a foppish coat, and these old things forget. In stormy times I'd give a vote for cuffs and collars yet. End of poem. Chapter 25 The Dons of Spain The eagle screams at the beck of trade, so Spain, as the world goes round, must wrestle the right to live or die from the sons of the land she found. For as in the days when the buccaneer was abroad on the Spanish main, the national honour is one thing dear to the hearts of the dons of Spain. She has slaughtered thousands with fire and sword, as the Christian world might know. We murder millions, but thank the Lord, we only starve them slow. The times have changed since the days of old, but the same old facts remain. We fight for freedom, and God and gold, and the Spaniards fight for Spain. We fought with the strength of the moral right, and they, as their ships went down, they only fought with the grit to fight, and their armour to help em drown. It mattered little what chance or hope, for ever their path was plain. The church was the church, and the pope the pope, but the Spaniards fought for Spain. If providence struck for the honest thief, at times in the battle's din, if ever it struck at the hypocrite, well, that's where the Turks came in. But this remains ere we leave the wise to argue it through in vain, there's something great in the wrong that dies as the Spaniards die for Spain. The foes of Spain may be kin to us who are English heart and soul, and proud of our national righteousness, and proud of the lands we stole. But we yet might pause while those brave men die, and the death drink pledge again, for the sake of the past, if you're doomed, say I, may your death be a grand one, Spain. 
then here's to the bravest of freedom's foes who ever with death have stood for the sake of the courage to die on steel as their fathers died on wood and here's a cheer for the flag unfurled in a hopeless cause again for the sake of the days when the christian world was saved by the dons of spain End of poem. chapter twenty six the bursting of the boom the shipping office clerks are short the manager is gruff they cannot make reductions, and the fares are low enough. They ship us west with cattle, and we go like cattle too, and fight like dogs three times a day for what we get to chew. We'll have the pick of empty bugs, and lots of stretching room, and go for next to nothing at the bursting of the boom. So wait till the boom bursts, we'll all get a show. Then when the boom bursts, it's our time to go. We'll meet em coming back in shoals with looks of deepest gloom, but we're the sort that battle through at the bursting of the boom. The captain's easy going when Fremantle comes in sight. He can't say when you'll get ashore, perhaps tomorrow night. Your coins are few, the charge is high. You must not linger here. You'll get your boxes from the hold when she's longside the pier. The launch will foul the gangway and the trembling bulwarks loom above a fleet of harbour craft at the bursting of the boom. So wait till the boom bursts. We'll all get a show. He'll take you for a bob, sir, and where you want to go. He'll take the big portmanteau, sir, if he might so presume. You needn't hump your luggage at the bursting of the boom. It's loafers, custom loafers, and you pay and pay again. They hinder you and cheat you from the gangway to the train. The pubs and restaurants are full. They haven't room for more. They charge us each three shillings for a shakedown on the floor. But show this gentleman upstairs, the first front parlour room. We'll see about your luggage, sir, at the bursting of the boom. So wait till the boom bursts, we'll all get a show. And wait till the boom bursts and swear mighty low. We mostly charge a pound a week, how do you like the room? And show this gentleman the bath, at the bursting of the boom. I go down to the timber yard, I cannot face the rent, to get some strips of Oregon, to frame my Hessian tent. To buy some scraps of lumber for a table or a shelf. The boss comes up and says, I might just look round for myself. The foreman grunts and turns away, as silent as the tomb. The boss himself will wait on me at the bursting of the boom. So wait till the boom bursts. We'll all get a load. You had better take those scraps, sir. They're only in the road. Now where the hell's the carter? You'll hear the foreman fume. And take that timber round at once at the bursting of the boom. Each one a penny grocer in his box of board and tin will think it condescending to consent to take you in, and not content with twice as much as what is just and right. They charge and cheat you doubly, for the boom is at its height. It's take it now or leave it, your money or your room. But who's attending Mr. Brown at the bursting of the boom? So wait till the boom bursts, and take what you can get. There's not the slightest hurry, and your bill ain't ready yet. They'll call and get your orders until the crack o' doom, and send them round directly at the bursting of the boom. No country and no brotherhood, such things are dead and cold. A camp from all the lands or none, all mad for love of gold. Where t'other side is number one, make slave of number two, and the vilest women of the world the vilest ways pursue. And men go out and slave and bake and die in agony, in western hells that God forgot, where never man should be. I feel a prophet in my heart that speaks the one word doom, and aye, eh, you'll hear the devil laugh at the bursting of the boom. End of poem. Chapter 27 Anthony Villa, subtitle A Ballad of Ninety-Three Over there, above the jetty, stands the mansion of the Vardens, with a tennis ground and terrace, and a flagstaff in the gardens. They are gentlemen and ladies, they've been toffs for generations, but old Varden's been unlucky, lost a lot in speculations. Troubles gathered fast upon him when the mining bubble busted, then the bank suspended payment, where his little all he trusted, and the butcher and the baker sent their bills in when they read it, even John, the chow that served him, has refused to give him credit, and the daughters of the Varden's, they are beautiful as graces, but the balcony's deserted, and they rarely show their faces, and the swells of their acquaintance never seem to venture near them, and the bailiff says they seldom have a cup of tea to cheer them. They were butterflies. I always was a common caterpillar. 
but I'm sorry for the ladies over there in Tony Villa. Shut up there in Tony Villa, with the bailiff and their trouble, and the dried-up reservoir where my tears were seen to bubble. Mrs. Rooney thinks it's nothing when she sends a brat to borrow, just a pinch of tea and sugar, till the grocer comes tomorrow. But it's different with the Vardens. They would starve to death as soon as, knuckle down, you know, they weren't raised exactly like the Rooneys. There is gossip in the boxes and the drawing rooms and gardens. Have you heard of Varden's failure? Have you heard about the Vardens? And no doubt each tony mother on the point across the waters might glad about the downfall of the rival of her daughters. Though the poets and the writers say that man to man's inhuman, I'm inclined to think it's nothing to what woman is to woman, more especially the ladies, save perhaps a fellow's mother, and I think that men are better, they are kinder to each other. There's a youngster by the jetty gathering cinders from the ashes. He was known as Master Varden, ere the great financial crashes. And his manner shows the difference, twixt the nursery and the gutter, but I've seen him at the grocer's buying half a pound of butter. And his mother fights her trouble in the house across the water. She is just as proud as Varden, though she was a cocky's daughter. And at times I think I see her with the flickering firelight aura, sitting pale and straight and quiet, gazing vacantly before her. There's a slight and girlish figure, Varden's younger daughter, Nettie, on the terrace after sunset when the boat is near the jetty. She is good and pure and pretty, and her rivals don't deny it, though they say that Nettie Varden takes in sewing on the quiet. How her sister graced the circle, all unconscious of her lover, in the seedy god who watched her from the gallery above her. Shade of poverty was on him, and the light of wealth upon her, but perhaps he loved her better than the swells attending on her. There's a white man's heart in Varden, spite of all the blue blood in him. There are working men who wouldn't stand and hear a word agin him. But his name was never printed by the side of his donations, save on hearts that have, in this world, very humble circulations. He was never stiff or hoggish. He was affable and jolly. And he'd always say good morning to the deckhand on the polly. He would barrack with the newsboys on the quay across the ferry, and he'd very often tip him coming home a trifle merry. But his chin is getting higher, and his features daily harden. He will not give up possession. There's a lot of fight in Varden. And the way he steps the gangway, oh, you couldn't but admire it. Just as proud as ever hero walked the plank aboard a pirate. He will think about the hardships that his girls were never used to, and it might be mighty heavy on the thoroughbred old rooster. But he'll never strike his colours, and I tell a lying tale if Varden's pride don't kill him sooner than the bankers or the bailiff. You remember when we often had to go without our dinners, in the days when pride and hunger fought a finish out within us, and how pride would come up groggy, hunger whooping loud and louder, and the swells are proud as we are. They are just as proud and prouder. Yes, the toffs have grit in spite of all our sneering and our scorning. What's the crowd? What's that? God help us. Varden shot himself this morning. There'll be gossip in the circle, in the drawing rooms and gardens. But I'm sorry for the family. Yes, I'm sorry for the Vardens. End of poem. Chapter 28 Second Class Wait Here On suburban railway stations, you may see them as you pass. There are signboards on the platforms saying, Wait Here, Second Class. And to me the whir and thunder and the cluck of running gear seem to be forever saying, saying, Second class wait here. Wait here, second class. Second class wait here. Seem to be forever saying, saying, Second class wait here. And the second class were waiting in the days of surf and prince, and the second class are waiting. They've been waiting ever since. There are gardens in the background, and the line is bare and drear, yet they wait beneath a signboard sneering, Second class wait here. I have waited oft in winter, in the mornings dark and damp, when the asphalt platform glistened underneath the lonely lamp, ghastly on the brick-faced cutting, Salem's soap and blower's beer, ghastly on enameled signboards with their second-class wait here. And the others seemed like burglars, slouched and muffled to the throats, standing round apart and silent in their shoddy overcoats, and the wind among the wires, and the poplars bleak and bare, seemed to be forever snarling, snarling, Second class wait there. Out beyond the furthest suburb, neath a chimney stack alone, lay the works of Grinder Brothers with a platform of their own. 
and I waited there and suffered, waited there for many a year, slaved beneath a phantom signboard telling our class to wait here. Ah, a man must feel revengeful for a boyhood such as mine. God, I hate the very houses near the workshop by the line, and the smell of railway stations, and the roar of running gear, and the scornful seeming signboards saying, Second class, wait here. There's a train with death for driver, which is ever going past, and there are no class compartments, and we all must go at last, to the long white jasper platform, with an Eden in the rear, and there won't be any signboard saying, Second class, wait here. End of poem. Chapter 29 The Ships That Won't Go Down We hear a great commotion about the ship that comes to grief, that founders in mid-ocean, or is driven on a reef because it's cheap and brittle, a score of sinners drown, but we hear but mighty little of the ships that won't go down. Here's honour to the builders, the builders of the past. Here's honour to the builders that builded ships to last. Here's honour to the captain, and honour to the crew. Here's double-column headlines to the ships that battle through. They make a great sensation about famous men that fail, that sink a world of chances in the city morgue or jail, who drink or blow their brains out because of fortune's frown, but we hear far too little of the men who won't go down. The world is full of trouble, and the world is full of wrong, but the heart of man is noble, and the heart of man is strong. They say the sea sings dirges, but I would say to you that the wild wave songs a pean for the men that battle through. End of poem. Chapter 30 The men we might have been When God's wrath cloud is o'er me A frightening heart and mind When days seem dark before me And days seem black behind Those friends who think they know me Who deem their insight keen They ne'er forget to show me The man I might have been He's rich and independent Or rising fast to fame His bright star is ascendant The country knows his name his houses and his gardens are splendid to be seen. His fault the wise world pardons, the man I might have been. His fame and fortune haunt me, his virtues wave me back. His name and prestige daunt me when I would take the track. But you, my friend true-hearted, God keep our friendship green. You know how I was parted from all I might have been. But what avails the ache of remorse or weak regret? We'll battle for the sake of the men we might be yet. We'll strive to keep in sight of the brave, the true, and clean, and triumph yet in spite of the men we might have been. End of poem. Chapter 31 The Way of the World When fairer faces turn from me, and gayer friends grow cold, and I have lost through poverty the friendship bought with gold, when I have served the selfish turn of some all-worldly few, and folly's lamp have ceased to burn, then I'll come back to you. When my admirers find I'm not the rising star they thought, and praise or blame is all forgot, my early promise brought. When bright arrivals lead a host, where once I led a few, and kinder times reward their boast, then I'll come back to you. You loved me not for what I had, or what I might have been, you saw the good, but not the bad, was kind for that between. I know that you'll forgive again, that you will judge me true. I'll be too tired to explain when I come back to you. End of poem. Chapter 32 The Battling Days by Henry Lawson So sit you down in a straight back chair, with your pipe and your wife content, and cross your knees with your wisest air, and preach of the days misspent. Grown fat and moral apace, old man, you prate of the change since then. In spite of all, I'd as life be back in those hard old days again. They were hard old days, they were battling days, they were cruel at times, but then. In spite of all, I would rather be back in those hard old days again. The land was barren to sow wild oats in the days when we sowed our own. T'was little we thought of our friends believed that ours would ever be sown. But the wild oats wave on their stormy path, and they speak of the hearts of men. I would sow a crop if I had my time in those hard old days again. We travel first or we go saloon, on the planned out trips we go. 
with those who are neither rich nor poor, and we find that the life is slow. It's a pleasant trip, where they cried good luck. There was fun in the steerage then. In spite of all, I would fain be back in those vagabond days again. On Saturday night, we've a pound to spare, a pound for a trip downtown. We took more joy in those hard old days for a hardly spared half-crown. We took more pride in the pants we patched than the suits we have had since then. In spite of all, I would rather be back in those comical days again. Twas we in the world and the rest go hang, as the outside tracks we trod. Each thought of himself as a man and mate, and not as a martyred god. The world goes wrong when your heart is strong, and this is the way with men. The world goes right when your liver is white, and you preach of the change since then. They were hard old days, they were battling days, they were cruel times, but then, in spite of all, we shall live tonight in those hard old days again. End of poem. Chapter 33 Written Afterwards So the days of my tramping are over, and the days of my riding are done. I'm about as content as a rover will ever be under the sun. I write after reading your letter, my pipe with old memories rife, and I feel in a mood that had better not meet the true eyes of the wife. You must never admit a suggestion that old things are good to recall. You must never consider the question, was I happier then after all? You must banish the old hope and sorrow that make the sad pleasures of life. You must live for today and tomorrow if you want to be just to the wife. I have changed since the first day I kissed her, which is due, heaven bless her, to her. I'm respected and trusted. I'm Mr. Addressed by the children as Sir. And I feel the respect without feigning. But you'd laugh the great laugh of your life. If you only saw me entertaining an old lady friend of the wife. By the way, when you're writing, remember that you never went drinking with me and forget our last night of December, lest our several accounts disagree. And for my sake, old man, you had better avoid the old language of strife for the technical terms of your letter may be misunderstood by the wife. Never hint of the girls appertaining to the past when you're writing again, for they take such a lot of explaining, and you know how I hate to explain. There are some things we know to our sorrow that cut to the heart like a knife. And your past is today and tomorrow, if you want to be true to the wife. I believe that the creed we were chums in was grand but too abstract and bold. And the knowledge of life only comes in when you're married and fathered and old. And it's well, you may travel as few men, you may stick to a mistress for life but the world as it is born of woman must be seen through the eyes of the wife no doubt you are dreaming as i did and going the careless old pace while my future grows dull and decided and the world narrows down to the place let it be if my treasons resented you may do worse old man in your life let me dream too that i am contented for the sake of a true little wife end of chapter 33 chapter 34 the uncultured rhymer to his cultured critics fight through ignorance want and care through the griefs that crush the spirit, push your way to a fortune fair, 
and the smiles of the world you merit long as a boy for the chance to learn for the chance that fate denies you win degrees where the life light spurn and scores will teach and advise you my cultured friends you have come too late with your bypath nicely graded i fought thus far on my track of fate and i'll follow the rest unaided must i be stopped by a college gate on the track of life encroaching be dumb to love and be dumb to hate for the lack of a college coaching you grope for truth in a language dead in the dust neath tower and steeple what know you of the tracks we tread and what know you of our people i must read this and that and the rest and write as the cult expects me i'll read the book that may please me best and write as my heart directs me you were quick to pick on a faulty line that i strove to put my soul in your eyes were keen for a dash of mine in the place of a semicolon and blind to the rest and is it for such as you i must brook restriction i was taught too little i learnt too much to care for a pendant's diction i must turn aside from my destined way for a task your joss would find me i come with strength of the living day and with half the world behind me i leave you alone in your cultured halls to drivel and croak and cavil till your voice goes further than college walls keep out of the tracks we travel end of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five the writer's dream a writer wrote of the hearts of men and he followed their tracks afar for his was a spirit that forced his pen to write of the things that are his heart grew tired of the truths he told for his life was hard and grim his land seemed barren its people cold yet the world was dear to him so he sailed away from the streets of strife he travelled by land and sea in search of a people who lived a life as life in the world should be and he reached a spot where the scene was fair with forest and field and wood and all things came with the seasons there and each of its kind was good there were mountain rivers and peaks of snow there were lights of green and gold and echoing caves in the cliffs below where a world-wide ocean rolled the lives of men from the wear of change and the strife of the world were free for steam was barred by the mountain range and the rocks of the open sea and the last that were born of a noble race when the page of the south was fair the last of the conquered dwelt in peace with the last of the victors there he saw their hearts with the author's eyes who had written their ancient lore and he saw their lives as he dreamed of such ah many a year before and i'll write a book of these simple folk ere i to the world return and the cold who read shall be kind for these and the wise who read shall learn never again in a song of mine shall a jarring note be heard never again shall a page or line be marred by a bitter word but love and laughter and kindly hours will the book i'll write recall with chastening tears for the loss of one and sighs for their sorrows all old eyes will light with a kindly smile and the young eyes dance with glee and the heart of the cynic 
will rest a while for my simple folk and me the lines ran on as he dipped his pen ran true to his heart and ear like the brighter pages of memory when every line is clear the pictures came and the pictures passed like days of love and light he saw his chapters from first to last and he thought it grand to write and the writer kissed his girlish wife and he kissed her twice for pride tis a book of love though a book of life and a book you'll read he cried he was blind at first to each senseless sight for shabby and poor he came from local fashion and mortgaged pride that scarce could sign its name what dreamer would dream of such paltry pride in a scene so fresh and fair but the local spirit intensified with its pitiful shams were there there were cliques wherever two houses stood no rest for a family ghost they hated each other as woman could but they hated the stranger most the writer wrote by day and night and he cried in the face of fate i'll cleave to my dream of life in spite of the cynical ghosts that wait tis the shyness born of their simple lives he said to the paltry pride the homely tongues of the simple wives ne'er erred on the generous side they'll prove me true and they'll prove me kind ere the year of grace be past but the ignorant whisper of axe to grind went home to his heart at last the writer sat by his driftwood fire three nights of the southeast gale his pen lay idle on pages vain for his book was a fairy tale the world-wise lines of an elder age were plain on his aching brow as he sadly thought of each brighter page that would never be written now i'll write no more but he bowed his head for his heart was in dreamland yet the pages written i'll burn he said and the pages thought forget but he heard the hymn of the open sea and the old fierce anger burned and he wrenched his heart from its dreamland free as the fire of his youth returned the weak man's madness the strong man's scorn the rebellious hate of youth from a deeper love of the world are born and the cynical ghost is truth and the writer rose with a strength anew wherein doubt could have no part now write my book and it shall be true the truth of a writer's heart a cover the wrong with a fairy tale who never knew want or care a bright green scum on a stagnant pool that will reek the longer there you may starve the writer and buy the pen you may drive it with want and fear but the lines run false in the hearts of men and false to the writer's ear the bard's a rebel and strife his part and he'll burst from his bounds anew till all pens write from a single heart and so may the dream come true tis ever the same in the paths of men where money and dress are all the crawler will bully whene'er he can and the bully who can't will crawl and this is the creed in the local hole where the souls of the selfish rule borrow and cheat while the stranger's green then sneer at the simple fool spit your spite at the men whom fate has placed in the head race first and hate till death with a senseless hate the man you have injured worst there are generous hearts in the grinding street but the hearts of the world go west for the men who toil in the dust and heat 
of the barren lands are best the stranger's hand to the stranger yet for a roving folk are mine the stranger's store for the stranger set and the campfire glow the sign the generous hearts of the world we find thrive best on the barren sod and the selfish thrive where nature's kind they would bully or crawl to god i was born to write of the things that are and the strength was given to me i was born to strike at the things that mar the world as the world should be by the dumb heart hunger and the dreams of youth by the hungry tracks i've trod i'll fight as a man for the sake of truth nor pose as a martyred god by the heart of bill and the heart of jim and the men that their hearts deem white by the hand grips fierce and the hard eyes dim with forbidden tears i'll write i'll write untroubled by cultured fools or the dents that fume and fret for against the wisdom of all their schools i would stake mine instinct yet for the cynical strain in the writer's song is the world not he to blame and i'll write as i think in the knowledge strong that thousands think the same and the men who fight in the dry country grim battles by day by night will believe in me and will stand by me and will say to the world he's right end of chapter thirty five chapter thirty six the jolly dead march if i ever be worthy or famous which i'm sadly beginning to doubt when the angel whose place tis to name us shall say to my spirit pass out i wish for no sniveling about me my work was the work of the land but i hope that my country will shout me the price of a decent brass band thump thump of the drum and ta ra rit thump thump and the music it's grand if only in dreams or in spirit to ride or march after the band and myself and my mourners go straying and strolling and drifting along with a band in the front of us playing the tune of an old battle song i ask for no turnout to bear me I ask for no railings or slabs, and spare me, my country, oh spare me, the hearse and the long string of cabs. I ask not the baton or starts of the boar with the musical ear, but the music that's blown from the hearts of the men who work hard and drink beer, and let em strike up Annie Laurie and lettin burst out with lang syne tween voices of sadness and glory that have ever been likings of mine and give the french war hymn deep-throated the watch of the germans between and let the last mile be devoted to britannia and wearing the green and if in the end more's the pity there is fame more than money to spare. There's a van man I know in the city who'll convey me right side up with care. True sons of Australia and noble have gone from the long dusty way while the soul mourner fought down his trouble with his pipe on the shaft of the dray. But let them strike up Annie Laurie and let them strike up Annie Laurie, and let them burst out with Lang Syne, twin voices of sadness and glory that have ever been likings of mine, and give the French war hymn deep throated, the watch of the Germans between, and let the last mile be devoted to Britannia and wearing the green. 
and my spirit will join the procession will pause if it may on the brink nor feel the least shade of depression when the mourners drop out for a drink it may be a hot day in december or a cold day in june it may be and the drink will but help them remember the good points the world missed in me and help em to love annie lori and help em to raise on lang syne and let them strike up annie lori and let them burst out with lang syne twin voices of sadness and glory that have ever been likings of mine and give the french war hymn deep-throated the watch of the germans between and let the last mile be devoted to britannia and wearing the green unhook the west port for an orphan an old digger chorus revive if you don't hear a whoop from the coffin i'm not being buried alive but i'll go with a spirit less bitter than mine own on the earth may have been and perhaps to save trouble saint peter will pass me to comrades between and let them strike up annie lori and let them burst out with lang syne twin voices of sadness and glory that have ever been likings of mine let them swell the french war hymn deep-throated and i'll not buck at god save the queen but let the last mile be devoted to britannia and wearing the green thump thump of the drums we inherit war drums of my dreams oh it's grand if only in fancy or spirit to ride or march after a band and we the world battlers go straying and loving and laughing along with hope in the lead of us playing the tune of a life battle song End of chapter 36 chapter 37 my literary friend once i wrote a little poem which i thought was very fine and i showed the printer's copy to a critic friend of mine first he praised the thing a little then he found a little fault the ideas are good he muttered but the rhythm seems to halt so i straightened up the rhythm where he marked it with a pen and i copied it and showed it to my clever friend again you've improved the meter greatly but the rhymes are bad he said as he read it slowly scratching surplus wisdom from his head so i worked as he suggested i believe in taking time and i burnt the midnight taper while i straightened up the rhyme it is better now he muttered you go on and you'll succeed it has got a ring about it the ideas are what you need so i worked for hours upon it i go on when i commence and i kept in view the rhythm and the jingle and the sense and i copied it and took it to my solemn friend once more it reminded him of something he had somewhere read before now the people say i'd never put such horrors into print if i wasn't too conceited to accept a friendly hint and my dearest friends are certain that i'd profit in the end if i'd always show my copy to a literary friend end of chapter thirty seven chapter thirty eight mary called him mister they parted but a year before she'd never thought he'd come she stammered blushed held out her hand and called him mr gum how could he know that all the while she longed to murmur john he called her miss the brook and asked how she was getting on they parted but a year before they'd loved each other well but he'd been to the city 
and he came back such a swell they longed to meet in fond embrace they hungered for a kiss but mary called him mister and the idiot called her miss he stood and leaned against the door a stupid chap was he and when she asked if he'd come in and have a cup of tea he looked to left he looked to right and then he glanced behind and slowly doffed his cabbage tree and said he didn't mind she made a shy apology because the meat was tough and then she asked if he was sure his tea was sweet enough he stirred the tea and sipped it twice and answered plenty quite and cut the smallest piece of beef and said that it was right she glanced at him at times and coughed an awkward little cough he stared at anything but her and said i must be off that evening he went riding north a sad and lonely ride she locked herself inside her room and there sat down and cried they'd parted but a year before they loved each other well but she was such a country girl and he was such a swell they longed to meet in fond embrace they hungered for a kiss but mary called him mister and the idiot called her miss end of chapter thirty eight chapter thirty nine rejected she says she's very sorry as she sees you to the gate you calmly say good-bye to her while standing off a yard then you lift your hat and leave her walking mighty stiff and straight but you're hit old man hit hard in your brain the words are burning of the answer that she gave as you turn the nearest corner and you stagger just a bit but you pull yourself together for a man's strong heart is brave when it's hit old man hard hit you might try to drown the sorrow but the drink has no effect you cannot stand the barmaid with her coarse and vulgar wit and so you seek the street again and start for home direct when you're hit old man hard hit you see the face of her you lost the pity in her smile ah she is to the barmaid as is snow to chimney grit you're a better man and nobler in your sorrow for a while when you're hit old man hard hit and arriving at your lodgings with a face of deepest gloom you shun the other borders and your manly brow you knit you take a light and go upstairs directly to your room but the whole house knows you're hit you clutch the scarf and collar and you tear them from your throat you rip your waistcoat open like a fellow in a fit and you fling them in a corner with the maid to order coat when you're hit old man hard hit you throw yourself despairing on your narrow little bed or pace the room till someone starts with skit cat skit and then lie blindly staring at the plaster overhead you are hit old man hard hit it is doubtful whether vanity or love has suffered worst so neatly in our nature are those feelings interknit your heart keeps swelling up so bad you wish that it would burst when you are hit old man hard hit you think and think and think and think till you go mad almost across your sight the spectres of the bygone seem to flit the very girl herself seems dead and comes back as a ghost when you're hit like this hard hit you know that it's all over you're an older man by years in the future not a twinkle in your black sky not a split ah you'll think it well that women 
have the privilege of tears when you're hit old man hard hit you long and hope for nothing but the rest that sleep can bring and you find that in the morning things have brightened up a bit but you're dull for many evenings with a cracked heart in a sling when you're hit old man hard hit End of chapter 39 Chapter 40 O'Hara, Justice of the Peace James Patrick O'Hara, the Justice of Peace He bossed the PM and he bossed the police A parent, a deacon, a landlord was he A townsman of weight was O'Hara, J.P. He gave out the prizes foundation stones laid he shone when the governor's visit was paid and twice re-elected as mayor was he the flies couldn't roost on o'hara j p now sandy mcfly of the axe and the saw was charged with a breach of the licensing law he sold after hours whilst talking to free on matters concerning o'hara j p and each contradicted the next witness flat concerning back parlors side doors and all that twas very conflicting as all must agree ye'd better take care said o'hara j p but baby the barmaid her evidence gave a poor timid darling who tried to be brave now don't be afraid if it's frightening ye be speak out my good girl said o'hara j p her hair was so golden her eyes were so blue her face was so fair and her words seemed so true so green in the ways of sweet women was he that she jolted the heart of o'hara j p he turned to the other grave justice of peace and whispered you can't always trust the police i'll visit the premises during the day and see for myself said o'hara j pay case postponed twas early next morning or late the same night twas early next morning we think would be right and sounds that betoken a breach of the law escaped through the cracks of the axe and the saw and constable doggerty out in the street met constable clancy a bit off his beat he took him with finger and thumb by the ear and led him around to a lane in the rear he pointed a blind where strange shadows were seen while pantomime hinting of revels within will drop on mcfly if you listen to me and prove we are right to o'hara j p but clancy was up to the lay of the land he cautiously shaded his mouth with his hand wished man hold your wished or its ruined will be it's the justice himself it's o'hara j p they hished and they wished and turned themselves round and got themselves off like two cats on wet ground agreeing to be on their honor as men a deaf dumb and blind institution just then inside on a sofa two barmaids between with one on his knee was a gentleman seen and any chance eye at the keyhole could see in less than a wink twas o'hara j p the first in the chorus of songs that were sung the loudest that laughed at the jokes that were sprung the guest of the evening the soul of the spree the daddy of all was o'hara j p and hard cases chuckled and hard cases said that baby and alice conveyed him to bed in subsequent storms it was painful to see those hard cases sighed with the sinful j p next day in the court when the case came in sight o'hara declared he was satisfied quite the case was dismissed 
it was destined to be the final ukase of o'hara j p the law and religion came down on him first the christian was hard but his wife was the worst half ruined and half driven crazy was he it made an old man of o'hara j p now young men who come from the bush do you hear who knew not the power of barmaids and beer don't see for yourself from temptation steer free remember the fall of o'hara j p end of chapter forty chapter number forty one bill and jim fall out bill and jim are mates no longer they would scorn the name of mate those two bushmen hate each other with a soul-consuming hate yet erstwhile they were as brothers should be though they never will ne'er were mates to one another half so true as jim and bill bill was one of those who have to argue every day or die though of course he swore twas jim who always itched so to argufy they would on most abstract subjects contradict each other flat and at times in lurid language they were mates in spite of that bill believed the bible story re the origin of him he was sober he was steady he was orthodox while jim who we grieve to state was always getting into drunken scrapes held that man degenerated from degenerated apes bill was british to the backbone he was loyal through and through jim declared that blucher's persians won the fight at waterloo and he hoped the colored races would in time wipe out the white and it rather strained their mateship but it didn't burst it quite they battled round in maori land they saw it through and through and argued on the rata what it was and how it grew bill believed the vine grew downward jim declared that it grew up yet they always shared their fortunes to the final bite and sup night after night they argued how the kangaroo was born and each other held the other's stupid theories in scorn bill believed it was born inside jim declared it was born out each as to his own opinions never had the slightest doubt they left the earth to argue and they went among the stars Reconditions atmospheric, Bill believed the hair of Mars was too thin for human beings to exist in mortal states. Jim declared it was too thick, if anything. Yet they were mates. Bill for free trade, Jim protection, argued as to which was best for the welfare of the workers, and their mateship stood the test they argued over what they meant and didn't mean at all and what they said and didn't and were mates in spite of all till one night the two together tried to light a fire in camp when they had a leaky billy and the wood was scarce and damp and no matter let the moral be distinctly understood one alone should tend the fire while the other brings the wood end of chapter forty one chapter number forty two the peru it was a week from christmas time as near as i remember and half a year since in the rear we'd left the darling timber the track was hot and more than drear the long day seemed forever but now we knew that we were near our camp the paru river with blighted eyes and blistered feet with stomachs out of order half mad with flies and dust and heat 
we cross the queensland border i long to hear a stream go by and see the circles quiver i long to lay me down and die that night on paru river tis said the land out west is grand i do not care who says it it isn't even decent scrub nor yet an honest desert it's plagued with flies and broiling hot a curse is on it ever i really think that god forgot the country round that river my mate a native of the land in fiery speech and vulgar condemned the flies and cursed the sand and doubly damned the mulga he peered ahead he peered about a bushman he and clever now mind you keep a sharp look out we must be near the river the nose bags heavy on each chest god blessed one kindly squatter with grateful weight our hearts they pressed we only wanted water the sun was setting in the west in color like a liver we'd fondly hoped to camp and rest that night on paru river a cloud was on my mate's broad brow and once i heard him mutter i'd like to see the darling now god bless the grand old gutter and now and then he stopped and said in tones that made me shiver it cannot well be on ahead i think we've crossed the river but soon we saw a strip of ground that crossed the track we followed no barer than the surface round but just a little hollowed his brows assumed a thoughtful frown this speech he did deliver i wonder if we'd best go down or up the blessed river but where said i is the bloomin stream and he replied we're at it i stood a while as in a dream great scott i cried is that it why that is some old bridle track he chuckled well i never it's nearly time you came out back this is the peru river no place to camp no spot of damp no moisture to be seen there if e'er there was it left no sign that it had ever been there but ere the morn with heart and soul we'd cause to thank the giver we found a muddy water hole some ten miles down the river. End of chapter forty two. Chapter forty three. The Green Hand Rouseabout. Call this hot? I beg your pardon. Hot? You don't know what it means. What's that, waiter? Lamb or mutton? Thank you. Mine is beef and greens bread and butter while i'm waiting milk oh yes a bucketful i'm just in from west the darling picking up and rolling wool mutton stewed or chops for breakfast dry and tasteless boiled in fat bread or brownie tea or coffee two hours graft in front of that legs of mutton boiled for dinner mutton greasy warm for tea mutton curried gave my order beef and plenty greens for me breakfast curried rice and mutton till your inner sacrifice and you sicken at the color and the smell of curried rice all day long with living mutton bits and belly wool and fleece blinded by the yoke of wool and shirt and trousers stiff with grease till you long for sight of verdure cabbage plots and water clear and you crave for beef and butter as a boozer craves for beer dusty patch in baking mulga glaring iron hut and shed feel and smell of rain forgotten water scarce and feed grass dead hot and suffocating sunrise all pervading sheep yard smell 
stiff and aching green hand stretches slushy rings the bullock bell pint of tea and hunk of brownie sinners string towards the shed great black greasy crows round carcass screen behind of dust cloud red engine whistles go it tigers and the agony begins picking up for seven devils out of hades for my sins picking up for seven devils seven demons out of hell sell their souls to get the bell sheep half a dozen christs they sell day grows hot as where they come from too damn hot for men or brutes roof of corrugated iron six foot six above the chutes whiz and rattle and vibration like an endless chain of trams blasphemy of five and forty prickly heat and stink of rams barku leaves his pen door open and the sheep come bucking out when the rouser goes to pen them barku blasts the rose about injury with insult added trial of our cursing powers cursed and cursing back enough to damn a dozen worlds like ours take my combs down to the grinder will yer seen my cattle pup there's a sheep fell down in my chute just jump down and pick him up give the office when the boss comes catch that glory sheep old man count the sheep in my pen will yer fetch my combs back when yer can when yer got a chance old feller will yer pop down to the hut fetch my pipe the cook'll show yer and i'll let yer have a cut shearer yells for tar and needle ringers roaring like a bull wool away you son of angels where's the hell the fondling wool pound a week and station prices mustn't kick against the pricks seven weeks of lurid mateship ruined soul and four pound six what's that waiter me stuffed mutton look here waiter to be brief i said beef you blood-stained villain beef moo cow roast bullock beef end of chapter forty three chapter forty four the man from waterloo with kind regards to banjo it was the man from waterloo when work in town was slack who took the track as bushmen do and humped his swag out back he tramped for months without a bob for most the sheds were full until at last he got a job at picking up the wool he found the work was rather tough but swore to see it through for he was made of sterling stuff the man from waterloo the first remark was like a stab that fell his ear upon twas there's another something scab the boss has taken on they couldn't let the townie be they sneered like anything they'd mock him when he'd sound the g in words that end in ing there came a man from ironbark and at the shed he shore he scoffed his victuals like a shark and like a fiend he swore he'd shorn his flowing beard that day he found it hard to reap because twas hot and in the way when he was shearing sheep his loaded fork his grimy holt was poised his jaws moved fast impatient till his throat could bolt the mouthful taken last he couldn't stand a something toff much less a jackaroo and swore to take the trimmings off the man from waterloo the townie saw he must be up 
or else be underneath. And so one day before them all he dared to clean his teeth. The men came running from the shed and shouted, Here's a lark. Is gone to clean his tooties, said the man from Iron Bark. His feeble joke was much enjoyed. He sneered as bullies do. And with a scrubbing brush he guyed the man from Waterloo. The jackaroo made no remark but peeled and waded in and soon the man from iron bark had three teeth less to grin and when they knew that he could fight they swore to see him through because they saw that he was right the man from waterloo now in a shop in sydney near the bottle on the shelf the tale is told with trimmings by the jackaroo himself they made my life a hell, he said. They wouldn't let me be. They set the bully of the shed to take it out of me. The dirt was on him like a sheath. He seldom washed his fizz. He sneered because I cleaned my teeth. I guess I dusted his. I treated them as they deserved. I signed on one or two. They won't forget me soon, observed the man from Waterloo. End of chapter 44 Chapter 45 St. Peter Now I think there is a likeness twixt St. Peter's life and mine, for he did a lot of trampin' long ago in Palestine. He was union when the workers first began to organize and i am glad that old saint peter keeps the gate of paradise when the ancient agitator and his brothers carried swags i've no doubt he very often tramped with empty tucker bags and i'm glad he's heaven's picket for i hate explaining things and he'll think a union ticket just as good as whitely king's he denied the savior's union which was weak of him no doubt but perhaps his feet was blistered and his boots had given out and the bitter storm was rushing on the bark and on the slabs and a cheerful fire was blazing and the hut was full of scabs when I reached the great head station, which is somewhere off the track, I won't want to talk with angels who have never been out back. They might bother me with offers of a banjo meaning well and a pair of wings to fly with when I only want a spell. I'll just ask for old St. Peter, and I think when he appears, I will only have to tell him that I carried swag for years. I've been on the track, I'll tell him, and I done the best I could, and he'll understand me better than the other angels would. He won't try to get a chorus out of lungs that's worn to rags or to graft the wings on shoulders that is stiff with humping swags but i'll rest about the station where the work bell never rings till they blow the final trumpet and the great judge sees to things end of chapter forty five chapter forty six the stranger's friend the strangest things and the maddest things that a man can do or say to the chaps and fellers and coes out back are matters of every day maybe on account of the lives they lead or the life that their hearts discard but never a fool can be too mad or a hard case be too hard i met him in burke in the union days with which we have naught to do their creed was narrow their methods crude but they stuck 
to the cause like glue he came into town from the lost soul run for his grim half yearly bend and because of a curious hobby he had he was known as the stranger's friend it is true to the region of adjectives when i say that the spree was grim for to go on the spree was a sacred right or a heathen right to him to shout for the travellers passing through to the land where the lost soul bakes till they all seemed devils or different breeds and his pockets were filled with snakes in the joyful mood in the solemn mood in his cynical stages too in the maudlin stage in the fighting stage in the stage when all was blue from the joyful hour when his spree commenced right through to the awful end he never lost grip of his fixed id that he was the stranger's friend the feller as knows he can battle around for his bloomin self he'd say i don't give a curse for the blanks i know send the heart up bloke this way send the stranger round and i'll see him through and end as the bushman spoke the chaps and fellers would tip the wink to a casual hard up bloke and it wasn't only a bushman's bluff to the fame of the friend they scored for he'd shout the stranger a suit of clothes and he'd pay for the stranger's board the worst of it was that he'd skite all night on the edge of the stranger's bunk and never get helplessly drunk himself till he'd got the stranger drunk and the chaps and the fellers would speculate by way of ghastly joke as to who'd be caught by the jim jams first the friend or the hard up bloke and the joker would say that there wasn't a doubt as to who'd be damned in the end when the devil got hold of a hard up bloke in the shape of the stranger's friend it mattered not to the stranger's friend what the rest might say or think he always held that the hard up state was due to the curse of drink to the evils of cards and of company but a young cove's built that way and i was a bloomin fool myself when i started out he'd say at the end of the spree in clean white moles clean shaven and cool as ice he'd give the stranger a bob or two and some straight outback advice then he'd tramp away for the lost soul run where the hot dust rose like smoke having done his duty to all mankind for he'd stuck to a hard up bloke they'd say tis a song of a sot perhaps but the song of a sot is true i have battled myself and you know you chaps what a man in the bush goes through let us hope when the last of his sprees is past and his checks and his strength are done that amongst the sober and thrifty mates the stranger's friend has won end of chapter forty six chapter forty seven the god forgotten election pat mcdermer brought the tidings to the town of god forgotten there are lively days before ye comin parliaments dissolved and the boys were all excited for the state of course was rotten and in subsequent elections god forgotten was involved there was little there to live for save in drinking beer and eating but we rose on this occasion ere the news appeared in print for the boys of god forgotten at a wild uproarious meeting nominated billy blazes for the common parliament other towns had other favorites but the day before the battle bushmen flocked to god forgotten and the distant sheds were still 
sheep were left to go to glory and neglected mobs of cattle went astraying down the river at their sweet bucolic will william spouter stood for free trade and his votes were split by nothing he had influence behind them and he also had the tin but across the lonely flatlands came the cry of god forgotten vote for blazes and protection and the land you're living in pat mcdermer said ye shamers please to shut your ugly faces lend your dirty ears a moment while i give ye all a hint keep ye sober till tomorrow and record your vote for blazes if ye want to send a ringer to the common parliament as a young and growing township god forgotten's been neglected and if we'd be represented now's the moment to begin have it the local towns encouraged local industries protected vote for blazes and protection and the land you're living in i don't say that william blazes is a perfect out and outer i don't say he have the learning for he never had the luck i don't say he have the logic or the gift of gab like spouter i don't say he have the practice but i say he have the pluck now the country's gone to ruin and the governments are rotten but he'll save the public credit and protect the public tin to the everlasting glory of the name of god forgotten vote for blazes and protection and the land you're living in pat mcdee went on the warpath and he worked like salts and senna for he organized committees full of energy and push and those wild committees riding through the whiskey fed gahanna routed out astonished voters from their humpies in the bush everything on wheels was rented and half sobered drunks were shot in said mcdermer to the driver if ye want to save your skin never stop to wet your whistles drive like hell to god forgotten make the villains pump for blazes and the land they're living in half the local long departed for the purpose resurrected plumped for blazes and protection and the country where they died so he topped the poll by sixty and when blazes was elected there was victory and triumph on the god forgotten side then the boys got up a banquet and our chairman pat mcdermer was next day discovered sleeping in the local baker's bin all the dough had risen round him but we heard a smothered murmur vote for blazes and protection and the land you're living in now the great sir william blazes lives in london cross the waters and they say his city mansion is the swellest in west end but i very often wonder if his tony sons and daughters ever heard of billy blazes who was once the people's friend does his biased memory linger round that wild electioneering when the men of god forgotten stuck to him through thick and thin does he ever in his dreaming hear the cry above the cheering vote for blazes and protection and the land you're living in ah the bush was grand in those days and the western boys were daisies and their scheming and their dodging would outdo the wildest print still my recollection lingers round the time when billy blazes was returned by god forgotten to the common parliament still i keep a sign of canvas twas a mate of mine that made it and its paint is cracked and powdered and its threads are bare and thin yet upon its grimy surface you can read in letters faded vote for blazes and protection 
and the land you're living in. End of chapter 47 Chapter 48 The Boss's Boots The shearers squint along the pens. They squint along the chutes. The shearers squint along the board to catch the boss's boots. They have no time to straighten up. They have no time to stare. But when the boss is looking on, they like to be aware. The rouser has no soul to save. Condemn the rouseabout. And sling em in and rip em through and get the bell sheep out. And skim it by the tips at times or take it with the roots. But pink em nice and pretty when you see the boss's boots. The shearing super sprained his foot as bosses sometimes do, and wore until the shed cut out one side spring and one shoe. And though he changed his pants at times, some worn out and some neat, no tiger there could possibly mistake the boss's feet. The boss affected larger boots than many western men, and Jim the ringer swore the shoe was half as big again. And tigers might have heard the boss ere any harm was done, for when he passed it was a sort of dot and carry one. But now there comes a picker up who sprained his ankle too, and limping round the shed he found the boss's cast off shoe. He went to work all legs and arms as green hand rousers will, and never dreamed of boss's boots much less of bogan bill ye sons of sin that tramp and shear in hot and dusty scrubs just keep away from heaven em and keep away from pubs and keep away from handicaps for so your sugar scoops and you may own a station yet and wear the boss's boots and bogan by his mate was heard to mutter through his hair the boss has got a rat today he's buckin everywhere he's trainin for a bike i think the way he comes and scoots he's like a bloomin cat on mud the way he shifts his boots now bogan bill was shearing rough and chanced to cut a teat he stuck his leg in front at once and slewed the ewe a bit he hurried up to get her through when close behind his chute he saw a large and ancient shoe in mateship with a boot he thought that he'd be fined all right he couldn't turn the u the more he wished the boss away the more he wouldn't go and bogan swore amiably beneath his breath he swore and he was never known to pink so prettily before and bogan through his bristling scalp in his mind's eye could trace the cold sarcastic smile that lurked about the boss's face he cursed him with a silent curse in language known to few he cursed him from his boot right up and then down to his shoe but while he shore so mightily clean and while he screamed the teat, he fancied there was something wrong about the boss's feet. The boot grew unfamiliar, and the odd shoe seemed awry, and slowly up the trouser went the tail of Bogan's eye, then swiftly to the features from a plated green hide belt. You'd have to wring a shed or two to feel as Bogan felt. For twas his green hand picker up who wore a vacant look, and Bogan saw the boss outside consulting with his cook, and Bogan Bill was hurt and mad to see that rose about, and Bogan laid his woolsey down and knocked that rouser out. He knocked him right across the board, he tumbled through the chute. I'll learn the fool, said Bogan Bill to flash the boss's boot. 
the rouser squints along the pens he squints along the shoots and gives his men the office when they miss the boss's boots they have no time to straighten up they're too well bred to stare but when the boss is looking on they like to be aware the rouser has no soul to lose it's blarst the rouse about and rip em through and yell for tar and get the bell sheep out and take it with the scum at times or take it with the roots but pink of nice and pretty when you see the boss's boots rose about and picker up are interchangeable terms in above rhymes as also boss and super the shed name for the latter is boss over the board the shearer is paid by the hundred the rouser by the weak pink and pretty to shear clean to the skin bell sheep shearers are not supposed to take another sheep out of pen when smoke ho breakfast or dinner bell goes but sometime themselves to get so many sheep out and one as the bell goes which makes more work for the rouser and entrenches on his smoke hole as he must leave his board clean shearers are seldom or never find now end of chapter forty eight chapter forty nine the captain of the push as the night was falling slowly down on city town and bush from a slum in jones alley slope the captain of the push and he scowled towards the north and he scowled towards the south as he hooked his little finger in the corners of his mouth then the whistle loud and shrill woke the echoes of the rocks and a dozen goals came sloping round the corners of the blocks there was naught to rouse their anger yet the oath that each one swore seemed less fit for publication than the one that went before for they spoke the gutter language with the easy flow that comes only to the men whose childhood knew the brothels and the slums then they spat in turns and halted and the one that came behind spitting fiercely on the pavement called on heaven to strike him blind let us first describe the captain bottle-shouldered pale and thin for he was the beau ideal of a sydney larkin and his hat was most suggestive of the city where we live with a gallows tilt that no one save a larkin can give and the coat a little shorter than the writer would desire showed a more or less uncertain portion of the strange attire that which tailors know as trousers known by him as bloomin bags hanging loosely from his person swept with tattered ends the flags and he had a pointed stern post to the boots that peeped below which he laced up from the centre of the nail of his great toe and he wore his shirt uncollared and the tie correctly wrong but i think his vest was shorter than should be in one so long and the captain crooked his finger at a stranger on the curb whom he qualified politely with an adjective and verb and he begged the gory bleeders that they wouldn't interrupt till he gave an introduction it was painfully abrupt here's the bleedin push mccovey here's a something from the bush strike me dead he wants to join us said the captain of the push said the stranger i am nothing but a bushy and a dunce but i read about the bleeders in the weekly gas bag once sitting lonely in the humpy 
when the wind began to whoosh how i longed to share the dangers and the pleasures of the push gosh i hate the swells and good uns i could burn em in their beds i am with you if you'll have me and i'll break their blazoned heads now look here exclaimed the captain to the stranger from the bush now look here suppose a feller was to split upon the push would you lay for him and fetch him even if the traps were round would you lay him out and kick him to a jelly on the ground would you jump upon the nameless kill or cripple him or both speak or else i'll speak the stranger answered my colonel oath now look here exclaimed the captain to the stranger from the bush now look here suppose the bleeders let you come and join the push would you smash a bleeding bobby if you got the blank alone would you break a swell or chinky spit his garret with a stone would you have a maul to keep your like to swear off work for good yes my oath replied the stranger my colonel oath i would now look here exclaimed the captain to the stranger from the bush now look here before the bleeders let yer come and join the push you must prove that you're a blazer you must prove that you have grit worthy of a gory bleeder you must show you form a bit take a rock and smash that winder and the stranger nothing loth took the rock and smash they only muttered my coronal oath so they swore him in and found him sure of aim and light of heel and his only fault if any lay in his excessive zeal he was good at throwing metal but we chronicle with pain that he jumped upon a victim damaging the watch and chain ere the bleeders had secured them yet the captain of the push swore a dozen oaths in favor of the stranger from the bush late next morn the captain rising hoarse and thirsty from his lair called the newly feathered bleeder but the stranger wasn't there quickly going through the pockets of his bloomin bags he learned that the stranger had been through him for the stuff his maul had earned and the language that he muttered i should scarcely like to tell stars and notes of exclamation blank and dash will do as well in the night the captain's signal woke the echoes of the rocks brought the gory bleeders sloping through the shadows of the blocks and they swore the stranger's action was a blood escaping shame while they waited for the nameless but the nameless never came and the bleeders soon forgot him but the captain of the push still is laying round in ballast for the nameless from the bush end of chapter forty nine chapter fifty billy's square affair long bill the captain of the push was tired of his estate and wished to change his life and win the love of something straight twas rumored that the gory bees had heard long bill declare that he would turn respectable and wed a square affair he craved the kiss of innocence his spirit longed to rise the crimson streak his faithful peace grew hateful in his eyes and though in her entirety the crimson streak was there i grieve to state the crimson street was not a square affair he wanted clothes a masher suit he wanted boots and hat 
His girl had earned a quid or two. He wouldn't part with that. And so he went to Brickfield Hill, and from a draper there, he shook the proper kind of togs to fetch a square affair. Long Bill went to the barber's shop and had a shave and singe, and from his narrow forehead combed his darling Mabel fringe. Long Bill put on a square cut, and he brushed his boots with care, and roved about the gardens till he mashed a square affair. She was a tony servant girl from somewhere on the shore. She dressed in style that suited Bill. He could not wish for more. While in her guileless presence, he had ceased to chew or swear. He knew the kind of barrack that can fetch a square affair. To thus desert, he done a old was risky and a sin, and would have served him right if she had caved his garret in. The gory bleeders thought it too and warned him to take care in case the Crimson Street got scent of Billy's square affair. He took her to the stalls, twas dear, but Billy said, what odds? He couldn't take his square affair amongst the Crimson Gods. They wandered in the park at night and hugged each other there. But ah, the Crimson Streak got wind of Billy's square affair. The blank and space and stars, she yelled, the nameless Crimson Dash. I'll smash the blanky Crimson and his square affair. I'll smash. In short, she drank and raved and shrieked and tore her Crimson hair and swore to murder Billy, and to pound his square affair. And so one summer evening, as the day was growing dim, she watched her bloke go out, and foxed his square affair and him. That night the park was startled by the shrieks that rent the air. The streak had gone for Billy, and for Billy's square affair. The gory push had foxed the streak they foxed her to the park and they of course were close at hand to see the bleeding lark a cop arrived in time to hear a gory bee declare gore blarmy here's the red streak foul of billy's square affair now billy scowls about the rocks his manly beauty marred and Billy's girl upon her ed is doin' six months ard. Billy's swivel eye is in a sling, his heart is in despair, and in Sydney hospital lies Billy's square affair. End of chapter 50 Chapter 51 A Dairy on a Cove Twas in the felon's dock he stood, his eyes were black and blue, his voice with grief was broken, and his nose was broken too. He muttered as that broken nose he wiped upon his cap, It's awful when the police has got a dairy on a chap. I am a honest working cove, as any bloke can see. Is just because the police has got a dearie, sir, on me. Oh, yes, the legal gents can grin. I say it ain't no joke. It's cruel when the police has got a dearie on a bloke. Why don't you go to work, he said. He muttered, why don't you? Your honor knows as well as me there ain't no work to do. And when I try to find a job, I'm shattered by a trap. It's awful when the police has got a deary on a chap. I sighed and shed a tearlet for that noble nature marred. But ah, the bench was rough on him and gave him six months hard. But only said, beyond the grave, you'll cop it hot by Jove. 
there ain't no angel pleased to get a dairy on a cove end of chapter 51 chapter 52 rise ye rise ye rise ye rise ye noble toilers claim your rights with fire and steel rise ye for the cursed tyrants crush ye with the hyren eel they would treat ye worse than slaves they would treat ye worse than brutes rise and crush the selfish tyrants crush them with your hobnail boots rise ye rise ye glorious toilers rise ye rise ye noble toilers awake arise rise ye rise ye noble toilers tyrants come across the waves will ye yield the rights of labor will ye will ye still be slaves rise ye rise ye mighty toilers and revoke the rotten laws lo your wives go out a washing while ye battle for the cause rise ye rise ye glorious toilers rise ye rise ye noble toilers awake arise o glorious dawn is breaking lo the tyrant trembles now he will starve us here no longer toilers will not bend or bow rise ye rise ye noble toilers rise behold revenge is near see the leaders of the people come and have a pint of beer rise ye rise ye noble toilers rise ye rise ye glorious toilers awake arise lo the poor are starved my brothers lo our wives and children weep lo our women toil to keep us while the toilers are asleep rise ye rise ye noble toilers rise and break the tyrant's chain march ye march ye mighty toilers even to the battle plain rise ye rise ye noble toilers rise ye rise ye noble toilers awake arise end of chapter 52 chapter 53 the ballad of mabel clare ye children of the land of gold i sing a song to you and if the jokes are somewhat old the main ideas new so be it sung by hut and tent where tall the native grows and understand the song is meant for singing through the nose there dwelt a hard old cockatoo on western hills far out where everything is green and blue except of course in drought a crimson anarchist was he held other men in scorn ye preached that every man was free and also echo born he lived in his ancestral hut his missus wasn't there and there was no one with him but his daughter mabel clare her eyes and hair were like the sun her foot was like a mat her cheeks a trifle overdone she was a democrat a manly independence born among the trees she had she treated womankind with scorn and often cursed her dad she hated swells and shining lights for she had seen a few and she believed in woman's rights she mostly gotten too a stranger at the neighboring run sojourned the swatter's guest he was unknown to any one but like a swell was dressed he had an eyeglass to his eye a collar to his ears his feet were made to tread the sky his mouth was formed for sneers he wore the latest toggery the loudest thing in ties twas generally reckoned he was something in disguise 
but who he was or whence he came was long unknown except unto the squatter who the name and noble secret kept and strolling in the noontide heat beneath the blinding glare this noble stranger chanced to meet the radiant mabel clare she saw at once he was a swell according to her lights but ah tis very sad to tell she met him oft of nights and strolling through a moonlight gorge she chatted all the while of ingersoll and henry george and radla and carlyle in short he learned to love the girl and things went on like this until he said he was an earl and asked her to be his oh say no more lord colony oh say no more she said oh say no more lord colony i wish that i was dead my head is in a awful whirl the truth i dare not tell i am a democratic girl and cannot wed a swell oh love he cried but you forget that you are most unjust twas not my fault that i was set within the upper crust heed not the yarns the poets tell o oh, darling do not doubt a simple lord can love as well as any rouse about for you i'll give my fortune up i'd go to work for you i'll put the money in the cup and drop the title too oh fly with me oh fly with me across the mountains blue ho oh, fly with me ho oh, fly with me that very night she flew they took the train and journeyed down across the range they sped until they came to sydney town where shortly they were wed and still upon the western wild admiring teamsters tell how mabel's father cursed his child for clearing with a swell what ails my bird this bridal night exclaim lord colony what ails my own this bridal night o love confide in me o oh, now she said that i am yours you'll let me weep i must i did desert the people's cause to join the upper crust o oh, proudly smiled his lordship then his chimney pot he floored look up my love and smile again for i am not a lord his eyeglass from his eye he tore the dicky from his breast and turned and stood his bride before a rouse about confessed unknown i loved you long he said and i have loved you true a shearing in your governor's shed i learned to worship you i do not care for place or pelf for now my love i'm sure that you will love me for myself and not because i'm poor to prove your love i spent my check to buy this swell rig out so fling your arms about my neck for i'm a rouse about at first she gave a startled cry then safe from care's alarms she sighed a soul subduing sigh and sank into his arms he pawned the togs and home he took his bride in all her charms the proud old cockatoo received the pair with open arms and long they lived the faithful bride the noble rose about and if she wasn't satisfied he never let it out end of chapter fifty three chapter fifty four constable mccarthy's investigation most unpleasantly adjacent to the haunts of lower orders stood a terrace in the city when the current year began and a notice indicated there were vacancies for boarders in the middle house and lodgings for a single gentleman now a singular observer could have seen but few attractions 
whether in the house or missus or the notice or the street but at last there came a lodger whose appearances and actions puzzled constable mccarty the policeman on the beat he the single gent was wasted almost to emaciation and his features were the palest that mccarty ever saw and these indications pointing to a pass of dissipation greatly strengthened the suspicions of the agent of the law he the lodger hang the pronoun seemed to like the stormy weather when the elements in battle kept it up a little late yet he'd wander in the moonlight when the stars were close together taking ghostly consolation in a visionary state he would walk the streets at midnight when the storm king raised his banner walk without his old umbrella wave his arms above his head or he'd fold them tight and mutter in a wild disjointed manner while the town was wrapped in slumber and he should have been in bed said the constable on duty sure oi wonder what his trade is and the constable would watch him from the shadow of a wall but he never picked a pocket and he ne'er accosted ladies and the constable was puzzled what to make of him at all now mccarty had arrested more than one notorious dodger he had heard of men afflicted with the strangest kind of fads but he couldn't fix the station or the business of the lodger who at times would chum with cagers and at other times with cads and the constable would often stand and wonder how the gory showed the stranger got his living for he loafed the time away and he often sought a hillock when the sun went down in glory just as if he was a mourner at the burial of the day mac had noticed that the lodger did a mighty lot of smoking and could stow away a longin never winking so he could and mccarty once at midnight came upon the lodger poking round about suspicious alleys where the common houses stood yet the constable had seen him in a class above suspicion seen him welcome with effusion by a dozen tony gents seen him driving in the buggy of a rising politician through the gateway of a member's tony private residence and the constable off duty had observed the lodger slipping down a lane to where the river opened on the ocean wide where he'd stand for hours gazing at the distant anchored shipping but he never took his coat off so it wasn't suicide for the constable had noticed that a man who's filled with loathing for his selfish fellow creatures and the evil things that be will for some mysterious reason shed a portion of his clothing ere he takes his first and final plunge into eternity and mccarty once at midnight be it said to his abasement left his beat and climbed a railing of considerable height just to watch the lodger's shadow on the curtain of his casement while the little room was lighted in the listening hours of night now at first the shadow hinted that the substance sat inditing now it indicated toothache or the headache and again twould exaggerate the gestures of a dip so maniac fighting those original conceptions of a whiskey sodden brain then the constable retreating scratched his head and muttered sora want of me can understand it but i'll keep my eye on him divil take him and his tantrums he's a lunatic begora 
or if he was up to mischief he'd be sure to douse the glim but mccarty wasn't easy for he had a vague suspicion that a scheme was being plotted and he thought the matter down till his mind was pretty certain that the business was sedition and the man in league with others sought to overthrow the crown but in spite of observation mac received no information and was forced to stay inactive being puzzled for a charge that the lodger was a madman seemed the only explanation though the house was scarcely harbor such a lunatic at large his appearance failed to warrant apprehension as a vagrant though twas getting very shabby as the constable could see but mccarty in the meantime hoped to catch him in a flagrant breach of peace or the intention to commit a felony for digression there is leisure and it is the writer's pleasure just to pause a while and ponder on a painful legal fact being forced to say in sorrow and a line of doubtful measure that there's nothing so elastic as the cruel vagrant act now mccarty knew his duty and was brave as any lion but he dreaded being landed in an influential bog as the chances were he would be if the man he had his eye on was a person of importance who was traveling in cog want of sleep and over worry seemed to tell upon mccarty he was thirsty more than ever but his appetite resigned he was previously reckoned as a jolly chap and hearty but the mystery was lying like a mountain on his mind though he tried his best he couldn't get a hold upon the lodger for the latter's antecedents were known to the police they considered that the devil was a dark and artful dodger who was scheming under cover for the downfall of the peace twas a simple explanation though mccarty didn't know it which with half his penetration he might easily have seen for the object of his dangerous suspicions was a poet who was not so wildly famous as he thought he should have been and the constable grew thinner till one morning little dramon of the sort of revelation that was leapin from his sheath he alighted on some verses in the columns of the Freeman, with the christian name and surname of the lodger underneath now mccarty and the poet are as brother is to brother or at least as brothers should be and they very often meet on the lonely block at midnight and they wink at one another disappearing down the byway of a shanty in the street and the poet's name you're asking well the ground is very tender you must wait until the public put the guilt upon the name to glorious sorrow drowning and perhaps a final bender heralds his triumphant entrance to the thunder halls of fame end of chapter fifty four chapter fifty five at the tug of war twas in a tug of war where i the governor's hope and pride step proudly on the platform as the ringer on my side old dad was in his glory there it gave the old man joy to fight a passage through the crowd and bear it for his boy a friend came up and said to me put out your muscles john and pull them to eternity your governor's looking on i paused before i grasped the rope and glanced around the place and foremost in the waiting crowd i saw the old man's face my mates were strong and plucky chaps but very soon i knew 
that our opponents had the weight and strength to pull them through. The boys were losing surely and defeat was very near. When high above the mighty roar I heard the old man cheer. I felt my muscles swelling when the old man cheered for me. I felt as though I burst my heart or gained the victory. I shouted now together and a steady strain replied. And with a mighty heave I helped to beat the other side. Oh, how the old man shouted in his wild, excited joy. I thought he'd burst his boiler then, a cheering for his boy. The chaps, oh, how they cheered me, while the girls all smiled so kind. They praised me, little dreaming how the old man pulled behind. He barracks for his boy no more, his grave is old and green. And sons have grown up round me since he vanished from the scene. But when the cause is worthy where I fight for victory, In fancy I still often hear the old man cheer for me. End of chapter 55 Chapter 56 Here's Luck Old time is tramping close today, you hear his blutchers fall. A mighty change is on the way, and God protect us all. Some dust will fly from beery coats, at least it's been declared. I'm glad that women has the votes, but just a trifle scared. I'm just a trifle scared for why the women mean to roll. It makes me feel like days gone by when I was cane at school. The days of men is nearly dead, of double moons and stars. They'll soon put out our pipes to sed and close the public bars. No more will take a glass of ale when pushed with care and strife, and chuckle home with that old tale we used to tell the wife. We'll laugh and joke and sing no more with jolly beery chums and shout here's luck while waiting for the luck that never comes did we prohibit swillin tea clean out of common sense or legislate on gossiping across a backyard fence did we prohibit bustles or the hopes when they were here the women never think of this they want to stop our beer the track o oh, life is dry enough and crossed with many a rut but oh we find it long and rough when all the pubs is shut when all the pubs is shut and gone the doors we used to seek and we go toiling thirstin on through sundays all the week for since the days when pubs were inns in years gone past and far Poor sinful souls have drowned their sins and sores at the bar. And though at times it led to crimes and debt and such complaints, I scarce dare think about the time when all mankind is saints. T'would make the bones of Bacchus leap and break his coffin lid, and Burns' ghost would wail and weep as Bobby never did. But let the preachers preach in style and rave and rant in buck. I'd rather guess they'll hear a while the old war cry, here's luck. The world might wobble round the sun and all the banks go bung. But pipes will smoke and liquor run while Auld Lang Syne is sung. While men are driven through the mill and flinty times is struck. They'll find a private entrance still. Here's luck, oh man, here's luck. End of chapter 56 Chapter 57 The Men Who Come Behind There's a class of men and women who are always on their guard. Cunning, treacherous, suspicious, feeling softly, grasping hard. Brainy, 
yet without the courage to forsake the beaten track cautiously they feel their way behind a bolder spirit's back if you save a bit of money and you start a little store say an oyster shop for instance where there wasn't one before when the shop begins to pay you and the rent is off your mind you will see another started by a chap that comes behind so it is and so it might have been my friend with me and you when a friend of both and neither interferes between the two they will fight like fiends forgetting in their passion mad and blind that the row is mostly started by the folk who come behind they will stick to you like sin will while your money comes and goes but they'll leave you when you haven't got a shilling in your clothes you may get some help above you but you'll nearly always find that you cannot get assistance from the men who come behind there are many far too many in the world of prose and rhyme always looking for another's footsteps on the sand of time journalistic imitators are the meanest of mankind and the grandest themes are hackneyed by the pens that come behind if you strike a novel subject write it up and do not fail they will rhyme and prose about it till your very own is stale as they raved about the region that the wattle boughs perfume till the reader cursed the bushman and the stink of wattle bloom they will follow in your footsteps while you're groping for the light but they'll run to get before you when they see you're going right and they'll trip you up and balk you in their blind and greedy heat like a stupid pup that hasn't learned to trail behind your feet take your loads of sin and sorrow on more energetic backs go and strike across the country where there are not any tracks and we fancy that the subject could be further treated here but we'll leave it to be hackneyed by the fellows in the rear end of chapter fifty seven chapter fifty eight the days when we went swimming the breezes waved the silver grass waist high along the siding and to the creek where ne'er could pass three boys on bareback riding beneath the shooks in the bend the water hole was brimming do you remember yet old friend the times we went in swimming the days we played the wag from school joy shared and paid for singly the air was hot the water cool and naked boys are kingly with mud for soap the sun to dry a well-planned lie to stay us and dust well rubbed on neck and face lest cleanliness betray us and you'll remember farmer cuts though scarcely for his bounty he leased a forty-acre block and thought he owned the county a farmer of the old world school that men grew hard and grim in he drew his water from the pool that we preferred to swim in and do you mind when down the creek his angry way he wended a green hide cart whip in his hand for our young backs intended three naked boys upon the sand half buried and half sunning three startled boys without their clothes across the paddocks running we've had some scares but we look blank when resting there and chumming one glanced by chance along the bank and saw the farmer coming and home impressions linger yet of cups of sorrow brimming i hardly think that we'll forget the last day we went swimming end of chapter fifty eight chapter fifty nine
the old bark school it was built of bark and poles and the floor was full of holes where each leak in rainy weather made a pool and the walls were mostly cracks lined with calico and sacks there was little need for windows in the school then we rode to school and back by the rugged gully track on the old gray horse that carried three or four and he looked so very wise that he lit the master's eyes every time he put his head in at the door he had run with cob and co that gray leader let him go there are men as knowed the brand upon his hide and as knowed it on the course funeral service good old horse when we burnt him in the gully where he died and the master thought the same twas from ireland that he came where the tanks are full all summer and the feed is simply grand and the joker then in vogue said his lessons wid a brogue twas unconscious imitation let the reader understand and we learnt the world in scraps from some ancient dingy maps long discarded by the public schools in town and as nearly every book dated back to captain cook our geography was somewhat upside down it was in the book and so well all that we'd let it go for we never would believe that print could lie and we all learned pretty soon that when we came out at noon the sun is in the south part of the sky and ireland that was known from the coast line to athlone that we got little information re the land that gave us birth save that captain cook was killed and was very lightly grilled and the natives of new holland are the lowest race on earth and a woodcut in its place of the same degraded race seemed a lot more like a camel than the black fellows we knew jimmy bullock with the rest scratched his head and gave it best but his faith was sadly shaken by a bobtailed kangaroo but the old bark school is gone and the spot it stood upon is a cattle camp in winter where the curlew's cry is heard there's a brick school on the flat but a schoolmate teaches that for about the time they built it our old master was transferred but the bark school comes again with exchanges cross the plain with the outback advertiser and my fancy roams at large when i read of passing stock of a western mob or flock with james bullock gray or henry dale in charge and i think how jimmy went from the old bark school content with his education finished with his pack horse after him and perhaps if i were back i would take the self same track for i wish my learning ended when the master finished jim end of chapter fifty nine chapter sixty trouble on the selection you lazy boy you're here at last you must be wooden legged now are you sure the gate is fast and all the slip rails pegged and all the milkers at the yard the calves all in the pen we don't want poley's calf to suck his mother dry again and did you mend the broken rail and make it firm and neat i suppose you want the brittle steer all night among the wheat and if he finds the lucerne patch he'll stuff his belly full he'll eat till he gets blown on that and bust like brian's bull old spot is lost you'll drive me mad you will upon my soul she might be in the boggy swamps or down a digger's hole you needn't talk 
you never looked. You'd find her if you choose, instead of poking possum logs and hunting kangaroos. How came your boots as wet as muck? You tried to drown the ants. Why don't you take your butchers off? Good Lord, he's tore his pants. Your father's coming home tonight. You'll catch it hot, you'll see. Now go and wash your filthy face and come and get your tea. End of chapter 60 Chapter 61 The Professional Wanderer When you've knocked about the country, been away from home for years, when the past by distance softened nearly fills your eyes with tears, you are haunted oft whenever or however you may roam by a fancy that you ought to go and see the folks at home. You forget the family quarrels, little things that used to jar, and you think of how the worry, how they wonder where you are. You will think you served them badly, and your own part you'll condemn. And it strikes you that you'll surely be a novelty to them. For your voice has somewhat altered, and your face has somewhat changed, and your views of men and matters over wider fields have ranged. Then it's time to save your money, or to watch it how it goes. Then it's time to get a gladstone and a decent suit of clothes. Then it's time to practice daily with a hairbrush and a comb, till you drop in unexpected on the folks and friends at home. When you've been at home for some time, and the novelty's worn off, and old chums no longer court you, and your friends begin to scoff. When the girls no longer kiss you, crying, Jack, how you have changed. When you're stale to your relations, and the manner seems estranged. When the old domestic quarrels, round the table thrice a day, make it too much like the old times, make you wish you stayed away, when in short you spent your money in the fullness of your heart, and your clothes are getting shabby, then it's high time to depart. End of chapter 61 Chapter 62 A Little Mistake Tis a yarn I heard of a new chum trap on the edge of the never-never, where the dead men lie and the black men lie, and the bushman lies forever. Twas the custom still with the local blacks to cage in the altogether. They had less respect for our feelings then, and more respect for the weather. The trooper said to the sergeant's wife, Sure, I wouldn't seem unpleasant, but there's women and children about the place, and barn a lady's present. There's old King Billy would never a stitch, for a month may the drought cremate him. Bar the wand we put in his jerky head, where his own Queen Mary bait him. God save her strength and a peaceful reign, though she flies in a bit of a passion, if only want hints that her shoal and lux are a trifle behind the fashion. There's two of the boys by the stable now, be the powers I'll teach the varmints, to come with naught but a shirt apiece, and with dirt for their nether garments. Hold ye on, ye blaggards, how dare ye dare to come within sight of the houses. I'll give ye a warning all for once, and a couple old pair of trousers. They took the pants as a child a toy, the constable's words beguiling, a smile of something beside their joy, and they took their departure smiling and that very day when the sun was low two black fellows came to the station 
they were filled with the courage of queensland rum and bursting with indignation the constable noticed with growing ire they'd apparently dressed in a hurry and their language that day i'm sorry to say mostly consisted of plurry the constable heard and he wished himself back in the land of the bogs and the ditches you plurry big tight breeches policemen what for you gibbet our missus breeches and this was a case i am bound to confess where civilization went under had one of the gins been less modest in dress he'd never have made such a blunder and here let the moral be duly made known and hereafter signed and attested we should place more reliance on that which is shown and less upon what is suggested end of chapter sixty two chapter number sixty three a study in the nod a sailor named grice was seen by the guard of a goods train lying close to the railway line near warner town south africa in a nude condition he was unconscious and had lain there three days during one of which the glass registered a hundred and ten in the shade grace expressed surprise that the train did not pick him up daily paper in consequence the muse he was bare we don't want to be rude his condition was owing to drink they say his condition was nod which amounts to the same thing we think we mean his condition we think twas a naked condition or nod which amounts to the same thing we think uncovered he lay on the grass that shriveled and shrunk and he stay three hot summer days while the glass was one hundred and ten in the shade we nearly remarked that he laid but that was bad grammar we thought it does sound bucolic we think it smacks of the barnyard of farming of pullets in short unheeded he lay on the dirt beside him a part of his dress a tattered and threadbare old shirt was raised as a flag of distress on a stick like a flag of distress reversed we mean that the tail end was up half mast on a stick an evident flag of distress perhaps in his dreams he pursued bright visions of heavenly bliss an artist who study the nod never saw such a study as this the luggage went by and the guard looked out and his eyes fell on grice we fancy he looked at him hard we think that he looked at him thrice they say if the telegram's true when he woke up he wondered good lord why the engine man didn't heave to why the train didn't take him aboard and now by the case of poor grice we think that a daily express should travel with sunshades and ice and a lookout for flags of distress end of chapter sixty three chapter sixty four a word to texas jack texas jack you are amusin by lord harry how i laughed when i seen your rig and saddle with its bulwarks fore and aft holy smoke in such a saddle how the dickens can ye fall why i seen a gal ride bareback with no bridle on at all gosh so help me strike me balmy if a bit o scenery like ter you in all your rig out on the earth i ever see how i'd like to see a bushman use your fixin texas jack on the remnant of a saddle he can ride to hell and back 
why i heard a mother screamin when her kid went tossin by ridin bareback on a bucker that had murder in his eye what you're come to learn the natives how to squat on horses back learn the cornstalk riding blazes what you're givin us texas jack learn the cornstalk what the flamin jumped up where's my country gone why the cornstalk's mother often rides the day afore he's born you may talk about your ridin in the city bold and free talk o ridin in the city texas jack but where'd yer be when the stock horse snorts and bunches all its quarters in a hump and the saddle climbs a sapling and the horse shoes split a stump no before you teach the native you must ride without a fall up a gum or down a gully nigh as steep as any wall you must swim the roaring darlin when the flood is at its height bearing down the stock and stations to the great australian blight you can't count the bulls and bisons that you're copped with your lasso but a stout old mile bullock perhaps you'd learn your something new you'd better make your will and leave your papers neat and trim before you make arrangements for the lassoon of him er you and your horse is cat's meat fitten fate for sich galoots and your saddles turn to laces like we put in blucher boats and you say your death on injuns we got something in your line if you think you're fit equal to the likes of tommy ryan take your carcass up to queensland where the alligators chew and the carpet snake is handy with his tail for a lasso ride across the hazy regions where the lonely umus wail and you'll find the black track you while you're looking for his trail he can track your without stoppin for a thousand miles or more come again and he will show you where you split the year before but your best be mighty careful you'll be sorry you come here while you're skewered to the fakements of your saddle with a spear when the boomerang is sailin in the air may heaven help yer it will cut your head off goin and come back again and scalp yer p s as poet and as yankee i will greet you texas jack for it isn't no ill feelin that is gettin up my back but i won't see this land crowded by each yank and british cuss who takes it in his head to come a civilizing us? So if you feel like shouting now, don't let your pistol cough. Our government is very free at choking fellers off. And though on your great continent there's misery in the towns, and not a few entitled lords and kings without their crowns, I will admit your countrymen is busted big and free and great on equal rights of men and great on liberty. I will admit your father's punch the gory tyrant's head. But then we've got our heroes too, the diggers that is dead. The plucky men of Ballarat who towed the scratch right well and broke the nose of tyranny and made his peepers swell for yankin libs gold tresses in the roaring days gone by and doublin up his dirty fist to black her bony eye 
so when it comes to ridin mokes or hoistin out the chow or stickin up for labor's rights we don't want showin how they come to learn us cricket in the days of long ago and handlin come from canada to learn us how to row and doctors come from frisco just to learn us how to skate and pugs from all the lands on earth to learn us how to fight and when they go as like or not we find we're taken in they've left behind no learning but they've carried off our tin end of chapter 64 chapter 65 the grog and grumble steeplechase twixt the coastline and the border lay the town of grog and grumble in the days before the bushman was a dull and heartless drudge and they say the local meeting was a drunken rough and tumble which was ended pretty often by an inquest on the judge and tis said the city talent very often caught a tartar in the grog and grumble sportsmen and retired with broken heads for the fortune life and safety of the grog and grumble starter mostly hung upon the finish of the local thoroughbreds pat mcdermer was the owner of a horse they called the screamer which he called the quickest shepherd twits the darlin on the sea and i think it very doubtful if the stomach troubled dreamer ever saw a more outrageous piece of equine scenery for his points were most decided from his end to his beginning he had eyes of different color and his legs they wasn't mates pat mcdermer said he always came within a flip of winnin and his sire had come from england and his dam was from the states friends would argue with mcdermer and they said he was in error to put up his horse the screamer for he'd lose in any case and they said a city racer by the name of holy terror was regarded as the winner of the coming steeplechase but he said he had the knowledge to come in when it was raining and irreverently mentioned that he knew the time of day so he rose in their opinion it was noticed that the training of the screamer was conducted in a dark mysterious way well the day arrived in glory twas a day of jubilation with careless hearted bushmen for a hundred miles around and the rum and beer and whiskey came in wagons from the station and the holy terror talent were the first upon the ground judge mcard with whose opinion it was scarcely safe to wrestle took his dangerous position on the bark and sapling stand he was what the local stiggins used to speak of as a wessel of wrath and he'd a bludgeon that he carried in his hand off ye go the starter shouted as down fell a stupid jockey off they started in disorder left the jockey where he lay and they fell and rolled and galloped down the crooked course and rocky till the pumping of the screamer could be heard a mile away but he kept his legs and galloped he was used to rugged courses and he lumbered down the gully till the ridge began to quake and he ploughed along the siding raising earth till other horses 
and their riders too were blinded by the dust cloud in his wake from the ruck he'd struggled slowly they were much surprised to find him close a beam of holy terror as along the flat they tore even higher still and denser rose the cloud of dust behind him while in more divided splinters flew the shattered rails before terror dead heat they were shouting terror but the screamer hung out nose to nose with holy terror as across the creek they swung and mcdermer shouted loudly put your tongue out put your tongue out and the screamer put his tongue out and he won by half a tongue end of chapter 65 chapter 66 but what's the use but what's the use of writing bush though editors demand it for city folk and farming folk can never understand it they're blind to what the bushman sees the best with eyes shut tightest out where the sun is hottest and the stars are most and brightest the crows at sunrise flopping round where some poor life has run down the pair of emus trotting from the lonely tank at sundown their snaky heads well up and eyes well out for man's maneuvers and feathers bobbing round behind like fringes round improvers the swagman tramping cross the plain good lord there's nothing sadder except the dog that slopes behind his master like a shader the turkey tail to scare the flies the water bag and billy the nose bag getting cruel light the traveller getting silly the plain that seems to jackaroos like gently sloping rises the shrubs and tufts that's miles away but magnified in sizes the track that seems a risen up or else seems gently sloping and just a hint of kangaroos way out across the open the joy and hype the swagman feels returning after shearing or after six months tramp out back he strikes the final clearing his weary spirit breathes again his aching legs seem limber when to the east across the plain he spots the darling timber but what's the use of writing bush though editors demand it for city folk and cuckatoos they do not understand it they're blind to what the whaler sees the best with eyes shut tightest out where australia's widest and the stars are most and brightest End of chapter 66. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. End of popular and humorous verses by Henry Lawson.